Education to introduce our first presenter. Thank you. I didn't even do anything. Good morning. Thank you for braving the snow and ice to be here with us today. I'm very excited to get things kicked off and announce our first speaker, Victoria Elijah Keaton. Victoria Elijah is only a first year student here at EMU, but I knew last year when she came to audition for our School of Music and Dance that she had a bright future ahead of her, and that included working to amplify voices of those who may struggle to be heard. So let's just go ahead and get rolling. Would you please help me welcome Tori Elijah Keaton. Hi, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to the presentation today. My name is Tori Elijah and I use she, they pronouns. I am a freshman at Eastern as an elementary music education major. First off, I'd like to thank everyone for being here for the presentation. Um, this is a great opportunity to present what we have found so far and get questions that will help further our study. Today we will be discussing the unique experiences of gender nonconforming band directors in the workplace. Our research is unique in that it has not been widely researched as a specific subject, but does have a lot of research completed that relates to the topic. Studies conducted by Regier in 2021, Shanley in 2020, Scholdeis and Eastridge in 2020, and Scholdeis and Woolnow in 2022 found that a notable gender imbalance persists within the band teaching profession, with men making up around 73 to 83% of high school band directors in the United States. A study by Dr. Scholdeis in 2023 noted the ways in which many women report feeling marginalized in the field. A recent survey conducted by Dr. Schuldice, including almost 1,000 female presenting band directors in the United States, shows ample evidence of gender-based microaggressions. Further, a series of studies conducted by Bartolom in 2016, Bartolom and Stanford in 2018, Falky in 2023, and Sylvia in 2019, shows that transgender teachers often face marginalization as music educators. Dr. Schuldice also conducted a narrative study of one band director regarding his experiences before and after coming out as transgender at work and found that he experienced a profound sense of relief, not only in being able to express his true self at work, but also that the experience of coming out had been smoother than he originally had expected. While there are a growing number of studies on the experiences of transgender music teachers, there are virtually no studies exploring the experiences of music teachers who identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming, or gender expansive. Comments from the few non-binary teachers who participated in Dr. Schuldice's survey suggest that they face unique issues in the music education profession, such as fear of requesting to be addressed by gender neutral honorific or pronouns, being misgendered, and choosing to turn down a job because of anticipated discrimination and harassment. However, because Dr. Schuldice did not set out to explore the specific experiences of non-binary band teachers, these comments do not provide ample insight into the topic or guidance for the profession. The purpose of our individual research is to explore the experiences of band teachers who identify outside the gender binary, meaning not identifying as either female or male, entirely. We began by sending out an interest survey in which we asked for band teachers to provide us with number of years in the field, geographic location, and if they are out in terms of their gender identity in a professional setting. Their gender identity um, and number of years in the field. From there, we had 11 applicants. We chose six interviewees based on varying geographic locations, years in the field, and their professional setting answers. Our main research questions for these interviews were, how have participants navigated being out in their professional lives? How have participants' gender identity and or gender expression influenced their experiences in the workplace? And how do participants' experiences vary by geographic location, school locale, and their career phase? After obtaining IRB approval, we recruited six participants who identify outside the gender binary. Each participant either currently taught band, has taught band within the last five years, um, or is enrolled in a teacher music preparation program and aims to teach band after graduation. Our hope was to include participants who are at different phases of their careers um, from a variety of US states and different locales and regions um, so that we could explore the ways in which these factors influence teachers' experiences uniquely. Each participant engages in a total of two semi-structured interviews conducted via Zoom. The audio transcribings then are transcribed 
um, and analyzed using qualitative coding techniques to identify emergent themes. Findings of the study will be informative for the music education profession by allowing music educators to identify outside the binary to share their unique experiences inside the field. With this information, we can make the community more accessible and approachable for those individuals and further help them feel comfortable and ensure their success in the profession. This research will give voice to participants who share a guidance of professional advice for gender nonconforming music educators, along with the ways that administrators and colleagues can shape a more inclusive environment for this community. Our research began in January, where we began the journey to obtain IRB approval to use humans in our research. We were then approved in late February and began to recruit interviewees from our interest survey. Our study is still in progress, so, so for the symposium today, um, we reached out and interviewed two of our chosen six um, subjects, which are also the preliminary findings of their interviews now. All of our subjects are kept anonymous using pseudonyms for their names. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation, I will be using their states to identify them. Our first subject was from Pennsylvania, and slightly later last week, we interviewed another participant from Washington. Answering the main questions proposed, we discovered that Pennsylvania felt comfortable in their workplace to wear nail polish, tights, and more masculine gender professional style tops. They mentioned that their school setting didn't, that in their school setting, they didn't feel judged by students or colleagues for expressing themselves in this way, not even if perceived as the norm way music educators dress. They did, however, remark on how when visiting Seattle one time, they received much more looks and attention for how they dressed, making them more appreciative of the location they work and live in. We asked the participant, so you said you recently, like a year ago, decided to start dressing how you want and trying some things. Had you tried, you know, experimenting or pushing any boundaries previous to that? Or is that pretty much the first time? Directly quoted from our Pennsylvania subject, yeah, I have. Nothing happened, but like I also feel like starting teaching reset some of that. Because I was like, well, obviously I can't dress like that at school. So it took me nine years to decide that I could. It's also sort of like dressing this way, I knew I wanted to do it, but sometimes I would do it and I wasn't super happy with the results. So I was like, I'm not gonna do that. But it's the same thing with skirts. Right now, I really wanna wear skirts, but every time I get one, it doesn't look the right way and I want to look right. It's like I haven't curated in some way that I'm comfortable with that now. Just like knowing those other people I've seen on Instagram or whatever, doing what they do, that's what I like. I want to feel comfortable in my own skin. I finally sort of last summer, when I wasn't teaching, was like, okay, I'm gonna try all these different things and figure out what's worked for me. And then start the school year, I was like, I'm gonna do it. And one day I just did it. Whereas our Washington applicant, who identifies as non-binary, introduced themselves to the students with she, they pronouns in their second year of teaching because they felt comfortable in that school environment. Four years ago, they decided to come out as non-binary on our internet spaces they were comfortable in. They do not openly discuss their gender identity with students without prompting, but they have conducted lectures with their colleagues to teach them more about the LGBTQ plus community since there are such large gaps in their rural area where they live. We asked this participant, could you tell us a little bit about how you personally identify gender-wise now, and what's your kind of gender journey then? A direct quote from them, I identify as non-binary, no further qualifiers. I've kind of thought about, like, am I a gender something or a demi something, and where I landed, non-binary just works best. I just don't feel like I am anything, but a gender doesn't feel right either. I think my second year of teaching, I remember starting to think, maybe I'll try out she, they pronouns. The first time I ever introduced myself actually was she, they pronouns. It was my first day working in the building and it was to students because I felt very supportive in the environment and I knew it wouldn't be an issue with the school. The differences between big city areas of Pennsylvania being more accepting of gender expression and identity in the workplace and Washington rural areas being more weary in what information can be shared is a big part of what we hope to further delve into throughout the rest of our research in terms of difference of acceptance in different locales with the legislation and the workplace rules. Both participants shared the main reason for them coming out in the professional setting was less being comfortable as themselves and more being a role model for other students, colleagues and administrators to see that it was okay in professional settings and express yourself and your gender identity. The implications that we found so far lead us further into exploring more of the effects of gender expression in the workplace and the reactions from students, parents, colleagues, and administration, as well as geographic location and the role it plays in expression. 
We hope to end the research with advice for other music educators or aspiring music educators on how to feel comfortable expressing themselves and for everyone on how to make the music education field a more accepting and accessible place. At this time, I can take any questions before we end my presentation.
I was looking at some of the evidence that will inform some of the uh, work she'll be doing during her internship um, at a hospital setting. Clara Guilford. I'm a bit tall for this. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Claire Gilford, as you heard, and during this presentation we will be exploring the impact of music on the experience of childbirth. Pregnancy and childbirth can be one of the most intimate and meaningful experiences in a person's life. However, it can also be painful, intense, stressful, and potentially traumatic, both psychologically and physiologically. On this slide here, you will see um, a scale with kind of a couple different places where different things fall on the pain rating scale. So at the bottom, you'll see things like arthritis, sprains, toothaches. At the top, you'll start with causalgia, which is severe nerve damage due to burning. After that is digit amputation, and right after that is childbirth. So as you can see, even if you've not experienced childbirth, it is a very uncomfortable situation for many women. And while pain is definitely an uncomfortable experience, unmanaged pain during labor and delivery can increase emotional stress, slow the progress of labor, and contribute to an overall lack of maternal satisfaction. And any of these factors can increase risk for both mom and babies. So, how does music address some of these issues? Music is well known in the literature to relieve acute, chronic, and procedural pain. A meta-analysis by Lee in 2016 found 97 randomized controlled trials that indicated that music significantly decreased pain, emotional distress from pain, anesthetic use, opioid intake, heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration rate. These physi physiological markers, I'm sorry, These physiological markers um, are indicators that even though people felt like their pain was being relieved, their body was also responding to the music in ways just beyond their own perception of their pain. During childbirth, music has similar effects. In a literature review by McCaffrey et al., 2020, 22 out of 24 studies indicated that music significantly reduced pain. At this time, we know that music seems to be greatly beneficial in both pregnancy, childbirth, and during the postpartum experience. Um, however, it's unclear whether live or recorded music is more effective and exactly what musical qualities are most effective. A lot of the music had relaxing qualities, so it was regular, rhythmic, with no extreme changes in dynamics, and with a tempo that matched the human resting heart rate. Um, however, in a study by Malona et al., they used a piano guy's cover of Kung Fu Panda, Cello Ascents, um, for their piece. And if you know that piece, it does not stay calm the entire time. However, they still found that it significantly decreased self-assessed anxiety, and the maternal and fetal heart rates um, actually, their variations directly related to the characteristics of the music. So, while this might be a little confusing at first, like, oh, well, what really is, what part of the music is actually helping? Um, it makes sense if you think about it in context of exercise music or relaxing music. Childbirth is a really intense experience. When you're exercising, you probably don't want to listen to lullabies. So um, the music can definitely be um, related to the participants' moods. In addition to reducing pain, anxiety, and stress, Music was also found to reduce perceived fatigue, which is critical because the need for elective labor induction due to maternal fatigue may be avoided, thus significantly decreasing the risks associated with induction. So, why is this important?
Well, for one, music is low risk. It's not typically contraindicated for a lot of populations. Two, as you saw, there are many physiological benefits of the music. It's also cost effective. To hire a music therapist full time for an entire week, it is still less expensive than one epidural. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's also increased overall satisfaction from mothers throughout the labor, delivery, and postpartum experiences. And any decrease of maternal anxiety, fatigue, or stress is beneficial due to the risks associated with them in pregnancy and childbirth. In fact, America has the highest mortality rate of any first world country for mothers. This chart here is from 2020. In America, there were 23.8 deaths out of 100,000 live births, and France comes in second with only 8.7. In 2021, the maternal mortality rates rose to 32.9 per 100,000 live births. With this in mind, finding non-pharmaceutical alternatives to enhance the birth experience, reduce pain and anxiety, and mitigate risk is crucial to raising the standard of maternal health care. This presentation focuses on the use of music during labor and delivery. However, music can be impactful for a wide range of people. You will now have the opportunity to experience the effect of music in a live setting. You're going to hear me say a few words up here, play some music over there, and then um, come back and say a few more words before we end. All you need to do is listen. If you would not like to, I just ask that you um, keep in mind the respectful atmosphere of this space. So I would like to invite everyone to get comfortable in their seats. Maybe you have both feet firmly on the ground. And take a deep breath, inhale, and exhale. While I begin to play, I invite you to focus on the music, the lyrics, the sound of my voice. If your mind starts to drift, that's okay. Just gently bring it back to the music or focus on your breathing.
did, just take a moment to inhale deeply. And exhale. Maybe wiggle your fingers and toes. Take a big stretch if that feels right for you. Before we end today, I'm curious to know about your experience. So, in one to two words, <laughs> what was that like for you? Feel free to call it out, or you can raise your hand, whatever is most comfortable. But soothing. Peace. Unburdening. Unburdening. to not wander and stay within the song. At this time, I invite you all to ask any questions if you have them. have some experience. Um, I'll be at Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City. It is a level three trauma center, so I'll be doing a lot of pain management, um, but I'll be working mostly with children, hopefully a little bit with mothers as well. <laughs> Um, it's highly reliant on what the mother wants in her own care. If, if, you know, if she feels that pharmaceutical pain management is going to be what she needs, great, we can definitely complement that. But if she is trying to go for a more um, natural pharmaceutical free, we can also help her with that. Yeah. Yeah. What are some pain management interventions you might use with children? Oh, well, there is, there's a lot. And it's very highly individualized for any, any person. Um, one thing that we really try to do is and train with our clients and then move with them, whether they're at a really high pain level, start where they are, where they're really high, the music is really intense, and hopefully try to slowly bring it down from there. There's also something called the gateway theory of pain control, where essentially music acts as a second stimulus that kind of blocks the pain signals that are coming in. So that's some of the theory behind it, but there's a lot of different methods in the literature, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. My references are up here, as well as the slides and my website and contacts. So feel free to scan the QR codes. Thank you.
and I'm just going to hope that my presentation has a different outcome for those individuals. Um, homelessness frequently causes discomfort because um, a person may have had a loved one, a family member, a friend, or even themselves have experienced homelessness. Or you're a business owner and you have homeless individuals panhandling about your business and that discourages your clientele from frequenting your business. So <clears throat> you could also be someone who doesn't know anything about homelessness. You haven't had any experiences and that's okay too. Um, we're just gonna talk about it. First and foremost, we have to look and see what homeless means. Um, the phrase we like to use now is unhoused because frequently people say this person is homeless. Like homeless is their identity and it's not, it's a situation or a circumstance. So unhoused. And to be unhoused means you lack a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. It can be sheltered or unsheltered. And if it's unsheltered, it can be public or private. Public open spaces for everyone, private, someone owns that space. So we look and say, who was affected? Who was unhoused or housing insecure? Um, we look at the, the housing report from 2022. There is a housing report for 2023. It came out in December. I haven't updated the slides. Um, and roughly 500,000 people were unhoused and uh, about 70% of them were adults, age 25 and older. And we don't think about someone 25 years old being homeless. Um, but then there's families with children, so 17 and under. Homelessness is awesome because it doesn't discriminate, okay? It hits all ages, all races. It could be any of us here. A brief history on homelessness in 18th century England, they had the death penalty. So if you were a criminal, there was one step under execution and that was the punishment of transportation which meant you were getting out of England, you were going to one of their colonies. And that's what this continent was at that time. About 25% of the people who came and were identified, we call them colonists in our history, they were convicts. And of those convicts, some of them, their crime was being a vagrant, being a wanderer, being homeless. And so according to the Texas Homeless Network, one of the biggest causes of homelessness in, on this continent was genocide, killing the native people of the land and colonization. But if you read through the history of the colonists, they would say it's because you didn't have a strong enough faith or you're an indecent person. So from the birth of a country to the North and South siblings of that country getting into a big argument, um, war displaced those families and that left men without jobs. So they had to go look for work if they chose to. And this is why we say unhoused now instead of homeless because words matter. We know the words hobo, tramp, and some people think they're interchangeable, but they're not. A hobo was someone who was a migrant worker. They would travel looking for work. Where a tramp, it has its connotation, but the denotative meaning was someone who tramped about may avoid work if possible. And then this was also post-Civil War, so they were freedmen, freed slaves, and they were criminalized for the crime of idleness. They had left their pace of employment. Right. <laughs> so 
What is criminalization? It is ordinances or laws in communities, cities, towns that penalize people for violations of life-sustaining activities. So what's that? Sleep, eating, just standing somewhere. You're loitering if you're just standing somewhere. That's a life-sustaining activity. I'm standing now. We were all standing at some point earlier. And we're on Eastern's campus. If we were just standing or tramping about the campus, someone could say, I, I think you're homeless. You look aimless. You're wandering. You don't look like you're about some type of business. So they also enforce what they call a quality of life ordinance. Quality of life ordinances are where someone disrupts someone's peace. A lot of time is pertaining to hygiene. Someone's unpleasant, they're unkept. They're disrupting someone's peace. Kids get loud, they run, they play. They're disrupting someone's peace. Are they homeless? So. The outcome of being homeless frequently is it just impacts your health. Come on. I mean, people say, well, you know, there's people who have poor mental health. That could be true. Or, you know, they've got some kind of illness. That could be true. You know, or they're just, you know, they're alcoholics or they're on drugs and that's why they're homeless. All of those things could be true. And those situations may contribute to the individual being homeless. but it can also instigate it or exacerbate it. So the outcome is you have decreased healthcare access and you're limited to services and treatments. So you're not getting those x-rays. You're not getting those routine labs. So you're not finding out, hey, something isn't going right. So illness can happen as a result. And criminalization impacts not just your health, but your worth and your worthiness. When you are criminalized, treat it like you've done something wrong that's worthy of being punished. You're frequently separated from your belongings so you don't have your medication. Um, if there's something that's wildly sentimental to you, that could cause someone to have a breakdown. That's contributing to uh, mental illness. It also will give you a criminal record, fines, fees, and then you'll have a reputation of a repeat offender. Not only were you wandering about aimlessly without seeming like you were doing anything on Eastern's campus last week, but you're back this week. And we saw you a month ago. Well, suddenly you become a repeat offender. And once you get that kind of reputation, you get fees, fines, you get a criminal record, then your opportunities for housing and employment just go down. So as a social worker, we look at, first of all, we skipped the slides. I'll tell you what we were looking at. We were looking at person and environment, which basically means your environment impacts how you live. And so what do we mean by that? I've um, um, got a larger image and just some things that can happen to you in life that can happen in your environment. Um, the primary earner in your home can pass away. All of a sudden your finances aren't going well. You can get divorced. You may have illness. I am a nurse. I'm diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. My hands don't work as well as they used to. So I can't function in my field that I've been in for 20 years. I'm back in school and I'm excited. I'm going to be a social worker. But I didn't do anything to deserve rheumatoid arthritis. It's something that happened. It's part of my environment. And so it impacts how I live my life. I'm back in school. <laughs> but I only do nursing jobs on call, and I do home assessments. 
a so far cry from being on a cardiac floor, okay? And sometimes, like, the environment that all of us experienced four years ago was COVID. You know, there was a stay on some people's rent, but some people it wasn't. The rent was going up, the pay was going down. So this environment that we're all in right now at Eastern, something could change and any of us could be. Remember, homelessness does not discriminate. So in the past, uh, social welfare policies to help individual experience of homelessness were primarily private charities. Um, COSs, charity organizations, societies, they kind of had a technical way of handling this population because they want to coordinate care. It's because some people were learning how to... Just two minutes. Two minutes. I only have two more minutes. Yes. Oh my word, I talk a lot, you guys. Okay, so. Speed round. Um, welfare policies um, from the past. And then we have the federal legislation, Housing Commission, Fair Housing Act. Current social welfare policy. Some people are still struggling with housing is a human right versus you have to earn it. But here are some organizations that assist us currently. You can also talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you all about it. I'm excited about this topic. For your consideration, how does homelessness impact me? Two centuries of criminalizing the homeless proves that it's effective. Arrest records don't help. It's a temporary uh, solution, and it escalates the problem. It also um, is not responsible for distribution of law enforcement resources. Support of housing costs less than criminalizing people or not having housing. And homelessness doesn't just affect the person or their family, it impacts us all. So what can we do? I got this from my hairstylist. It says, I can't change the world, but I can change your hair. You just go to your corner of the world, your expertise, your skill, your passion, and do something. That's it. Um, we can't change the world alone, but that's what everyone is thinking. I can't do it by myself, but we all get together, we can move a mountain. Mother Teresa said, we can cast a stone across the water and create ripples. So please join me or grab a different friend and let's move mountains. And if you would like to um, use your camera on your cell phone, with this QR code, you'll have my list of resources. Are there any questions? I have a question. How did I do? <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your ear. And again, if there's any questions that come to mind, uh, we can address them. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Emma Hocken. Uh, until last uh, September, she was a student at Hope College on the other side of the state uh, as a performance major in violin. 
and she transferred here to be in our fine music therapy program as of last uh, September, and we are very delighted to have her. We are also delighted that she keeps up her performing. As you'll see, she'll be performing Mozart Concerto Number no. 4 in D major, <clears throat> excuse me, the first movement, with a cadenza by Joseph Joachim. Um, Emma is also a uh, concertmaster of the EMU, EMU Symphony currently.
This is not, it's not normal in a performance setting, but in the symposium setting, uh, we'd like to see if there is anybody that has any questions for our performer. Does anybody have any questions for Emma? I, I started when I was 11, so it's been just over 10 years. I don't have a ton of professional experience. I, when I lived in my hometown, I played for the local symphony, so that's about all the professional experience I've had. But, hmm? I, you know, I heard about it when I was in high school. I. I knew I had passions for both music and psychology, and so I was researching ways that they work together, and I discovered music therapy. I originally was gonna just get a degree in per performance and then go to grad school for music therapy, but I figured, why not just get my bachelor's in music therapy too? And I knew this was a good school to go to for it. Why is this a good school to go to? I mean, it's one of the two in the state. <laughs> But it also is one of the top ten in the nation, so I, kn I know I'm in good hands here. And I had a meeting with Dr. Gomber before I came over, and I know I just knew just from talking to her she was so reliable, so I knew I was in good hands. Well, I was kind of transitioning out of being a performance major to a therapy major, so I wanted something that was a little more laid back than what I was used to. That being said, I mean, this is not an easy piece, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it's not easy, but you know, it's, <laughs> oh, crazy, <laughs> don't even, but. <laughs> yeah, so not that this was necessarily a break. It was, I don't know. I think that's what, that's kind of what I intended it to be, but I, you know, I just kept going with it and I expanded on it musically more than I ever thought I would, so. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've never had a peg slip like that before. That was new. <laughs> Emma, what do you love the most about That's a good one. That's a good question. I really like, you know, I'm not going to say it's simple because it's not, but, you know, there's some sort of elegance to classical music, and I love... How, especially Mozart in all of his writing, he sticks to that elegance, but also, you know, he was such a prolific composer and he expanded on music so much within the guidelines that we know of the classical period. So I just love all of the, like, all the way he kind of breaks the rules with, like, modulations and chromaticism and stuff like that. Thank you. Continue. Uh, I get to introduce myself first. Uh, I'm John Dorsey, a professor of percussion in the School of Music and Dance, and it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce um, a junior music education major uh, from Ypsilanti, Michigan. This is Jonah DePriest. Good morning, everybody. Is this thing on? Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. 
Uh, today I've gotten the opportunity to talk to you all about the nature of marimba through Keiko Abe's Wind in the Bamboo Grove. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to give a very brief summary of Keiko's early life and her professional career, as well as her contributions towards the development of the concert marimba. She is widely known as one of the most famous marimba players to ever come from Japan and one of the most influential marimba players of our time. Um, before we, uh, okay, let's get Um, so Keiko was born in 1937 in Tokyo, Japan, and as an elementary school student, she began playing the xylophone. At 14 years old, she won a talent show hosted by the Japan Broadcasting Corporation in Tokyo and began playing xylophone live on air for them. And during her time in university, she continued to work with NHK, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, as well as other recording studios in Japan. Oh, yeah, I am. <coughs> Starting around 1962, Keiko was creating some of her first professional records, had formed a marimba trio, and had appeared on her own Xylophone Kids TV show, as well as a radio show called Good Morning Marimba. Um, one year later, the Yamaha Corporation would approach Keiko to help them develop the marimba as a co concert and solo instrument. And since she was getting recognized in Japan for having a distinct opinion on how the marimba should sound. Um, between 1969 and 1984, Yamaha would end up working with Keigo to create essentially the first version of the marimba that you see on stage. Uh, the most prominent change was the addition of the fifth octave of keys to the low end of this instrument, a change that Keiko personally advocated for. Um, Keiko Abe's method of composition is largely based on her ability to improvise on the marimba. When listening to different pieces she's composed, you can sense her distinctly unique style. Uh, through a completely musical lens, her music tends to include at least one of these generalized styles or forms. At some point, you'll hear spacious, free melodies that are interlaced with occasional new ideas or interruptions that are either foreshadowing a theme that is yet to come or calling back to a theme that you've heard before. You'll also hear intensely rhythmic sections where there's still a melody, but it is at odds with an uncommon rhythm pattern or dissonant harmony. These sections are where Keiko is trying to keep the listener and the performer on their toes. Um, again, this is a mass generalization of her composition style, and there is much more nuance and influence involved in her writing process. Japanese art and its relationship with nature, particularly, are heavily incorporated into her works. Wind in the Bamboo Grove specifically uses a very uncommon technique to portray the setting that the title is derived from. By using the shafts of the mallets on the keys, you can hear an emulation of the sound of bamboo shoots swaying in the wind. So hopefully at least one of you is wondering why I chose this painting to represent the title of my presentation. Pine Trees was painted by Hasegawa Tohaku in the late 16th century and is a visual representation of the concept of ma, which translates to space in English. The goal of the painting is to point out that the space between the trees is just as important as the trees themselves. I happened to stumble across this term and subsequently this painting while researching Wind in the Bamboo Grove because of how important the use of space is in the piece. Keiko uses this concept often throughout her compositions. In an excerpt from Keiko's biography of Virtuosic Life, author Rebecca Kite writes, in the opening of Abe's composition, Wind in the Bamboo Grove, the silence is played so that it has a place of equal importance with the sound that follows. The silence creates an evocative energy stimulating to the listener's imagination. Indeed, the opening of this piece is about possibility and the imagination. If the silence in the opening is rushed or even ignored, the entire piece will lose its evocative power. So after doing a little digging, I discovered the importance of this word, ma. See, in Japanese art, ma takes on a deeper meaning, one that puts an emphasis on the importance of space rather than just space existing. One unique thing about Japanese culture particularly is a heightened awareness of the simplicity of nature, including the vast emptiness that can accompany it. This philosophy contrasts our Western view of space or emptiness being something that tends to be negative or just meaningless in some cases. These contrasting cultures surrounding the purpose of space are deeply rooted in our Eastern and Western society's respective arts, with connections to nearly every art form, from architecture to music. 
I believe Ma is best represented by this old poem. Thirty spokes meet in the hub, but the space between them is the essence of the wheel. Pots are formed from clay, though the space inside them is the essence of the pot. Walls with windows and doors form the house, but the space within them is the essence of the house. Again, thank you all for coming, and please enjoy Wind in the Bamboo Grove.
Does anyone have any questions for Jonah? <laughs> Just overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. So he's done some amazing things in this amount of time. Um, but I, I particularly like just the marimba because of its like, expressive nature. It's like a giant like cello or violin. You can really get stuff out of it. So um, yeah, just yeah, like it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jonah. Please stick around. We have another session starting in 15 minutes, and there is uh, one music student on that, and there's some other uh, presenters of, from various departments around the campus. So please stick around.
the piece homage à Claude Debussy by Bela Kovács. Bela Kovács was a Hungarian clarinetist that was born in 1937 and passed away just recently in 2021. He started as a pianist and then would go on to study clarinet at the Liszt Academy. He was a part of the Hungarian State Opera Orchestra, Budapest Philharmonic Orchestra, and a member of the Hungarian Woodwind Quintet. Kovács was named an honorary member of the International Clarinet Association in 2011, and he has composed over 60 works that include works for clarinet, solo clarinet and piano, chamber ensemble, saxophone quartet, saxophone and piano, and though his series of homages are some of his best known works. The homages consist of musical tributes to composers such as Bach, Paganini, De Faya, Strauss, Caudalie, Bartok, Cacciatorian, and of course, Claude Debussy, who all inspired his playing. They were used as etudes for his students to become familiar with these styles that these composers wrote in. He had no intention of publishing any of these works until colleagues of his encouraged him to make these works for public use. The piece I am discussing today is written in honor of Claude Debussy, who was born in 1862 in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, France, and passed in 1918. He was born during a time where romantic music was rising. Debussy was best known for his, additions to the, for his addition to the musical portion of the Impressionist movement that had started just recently around 1867. Impressionism is a literary or artistic style that seeks to capture a feeling or experience rather than to create an accurate depiction. Debussy's music follows this exact style of composition by having a set form, but it is written freely and allows the listener to pay attention to, pay attention to their emotions through his music. Some of Debussy's most notable works include Claire de Lune from Sweet Bergamasque, Le Mer for Orchestra, and the Premier Rhapsody for Solo Clarinet and Piano. The Premier Rhapsody has a structured form that starts with a theme, brings in a first new set of material, then a second set of new material is brought out, it comes back to the first set and goes back to the original theme again, then closes out with a culmination of phrases from the entire piece. The homage follows suit with its exact similar form that Debussy follows. The first excerpt I would like to play for you today is from Debussy's premier Rhapsody, where he uses these long lines that blur the bars of the meter in order to give the impressionist style. In the homage, the tribute to Debussy, you can hear the similar ideas where the beat is a little ambiguous while having those same long lines in order to mimic the same style as Debussy. So I'll play an excerpt from the homage. Unlike composers such as Bach, where there is a set time and structure to be felt, this piece is composed in a way to have the downbeats feel more vague through the use of tide notes and syncopations. In Debussy's Claire de Lune from Sweet Bergamasque, you can hear the similar ideas of long lines and unstructured meter in order to give the listener a dreamy and reminiscent feel. I'll now play an excerpt from Debussy's Claire de Lune.
Debussy's use of triple meter followed by duple meter helps progress the music forward. In the excerpt that you will hear from the homage, you will hear triplets followed by groups of fours, which demonstrates how the pulse of the music does not change, but the feel of it does, driving the music forward without changing tempo. So I'll play that excerpt for you now.
Does anybody have any questions for Marcus? Um, what inspired you to choose this? Well, I did get some assistance from my applied professor, Professor Jackson, but I knew that I've loved playing Debussy. I've actually had the opportunity to play under Professor Lee, um, Claude Debussy's uh, Claire de Lune. So I really wanted to find another piece that was also for clarinet in this style. And this was kind of like a good way to incorporate solo clarinet to like a different kind of culmination of that. Uh, how does looking deeper into a piece of music help better understand uh, it as a musician? Well, it really does help you pull out kind of certain aspects of the music that you kind of wouldn't have, you know, seen through a first read. Like, as I was like being able to discuss the Impressionist style more, I was able to understand like how some of these concepts were used, because this was written in a way that like most composers that during this time did not follow this style of writing. So it was able to like help me realize that this is just a whole new concept and trying to portray that through the music. I think rehearsing time, because <laughs> last week I did have to, I had to put on a senior recital as well, so just finding time to be able to like run through and kind of get all these pieces put together in order to create a presentation that kind of was able to run smoothly in this way. Yeah, I think playing clarinet and piano are also like help in like creating that difficulty that you were talking about because there's like so many different ways to express each instrument. So I think that as I'm trying to get the audience, like get the music in a way that gets the audience to portray their, like go dig deeper into their emotions, it is really, um, I think the challenges that are different between those two are that just the way I have to like express on each instrument are a little bit different and like the air support versus kind of like hand speed to get those like notes to speak how I want them to make that that challenge. All right, thank you very thank much. You. I saw Dr. Octani. Uh, would you, where, Dr. Octani, would you like to would you like to introduce your student? Yes. Education. And before I'd like to start, I'd like to thank my great friends, the t the teacher ed department at EMU. Uh, especially Dr. Wendy Burke, Dr. Iman Graywall, and Dr. Ethan Lowenstein, who helped me on this paper. Uh, it would not have happened without you, uh, and especially without you buggering me to actually finish this paper, because it was quite long. Now, because of the growth of government oversight in public education and the rise of testing culture, teachers are quite trapped in a prescriptive curriculum that does not fit literally any student. I don't know any student that actually likes the learn it, regurgitate it, test, done, forget it kind of method. But there is a way that we can change the, the classroom through place-based education. And this 
<coughs> this speech has three parts. I'm going to be talking about the changes in teacher prep and the uh, growth of educational oversight, all the innovations in southeastern Michigan, and then why EMU is actually good at one thing <laughs> at the very least. First up, how has teacher prep changed? As we know in America, the government has a lot of oversight in the public education sphere. With the main act starting in 1965 with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act all the way up to the 2015 um, update to the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. Teachers have so much of the bureaucracy that is looming over them and they have to be a part of it and it's not allowing them to be the best teachers they can be for the students. And this is going on off of a long history of teachers having to be the, pri the priority in the classroom. They have to know everything an essentialist way of teaching. However, this has gotten a little out of hand. When teachers all around, the co all around the country know that students are meant to be the meeting makers in the classroom, and if the students don't learn anything, then something has to change. Now, with the rise of Common Core and testing, this leaves little room for the students to be the meeting makers. It ha it's like I said, testing, regurgitation, and students ultimately forgetting the basic things that they need to know to be the best people they can be. Now this really isn't fun. And with more federal oversight, the more trapped teachers are and they cannot really escape. As much as we try, there's not much that teachers can actually do if they have to meet every state requirement and every federal requirement that is placed upon them. But this could uh, be worked around when you bring in outside forces into the classroom through place-based education. And Southeast Michigan is a great example of this. In Southeast Michigan, we have a long history of innovation in the classroom, starting most likely from Rust Belt migration, both from the US South and from other countries. The Rust Belt was the home of industry. It's where people wanted to go to, be, to reach the American dream. Work yourself until you make it financially, and then live off the fat of the land. As impossible as that is, it is the dream people saw, and it's what drew them into this region. And because of that, so many people with so many different educational needs and backgrounds came to Southeast Michigan. And personally, the te I know that the teachers had to work very much around that. Being, in an, an adjacent, being from an adjacent area and as a substitute, seeing the amount of immigration coming into my own community. You have to work around language barriers, different learning styles, different cultures, different student abilities even. And teachers had to get creative. And one of the most creative developments started in the 90s with place-based education. This brings in local communities, local businesses, and allows students to actually make a change in their community. This starts as young as kindergarten, as I have seen. And students are leaders, not just learners, when they make, when they make decisions that can absolutely benefit their community. One of the most fascinating, one of the most fascinating examples I've seen uh, while researching uh, the Southeastern Michigan uh, Coalition, uh, no, Southeastern Michigan, uh, something coalition. My brain is not working this early. <laughs> um, CMIS, uh, SEMIS. Um, they allow, they worked with a school in the greater area around this area, around the school, and they allowed the students to research how to rebuild a watershed around their school because the, because the area was flooding. The students worked and they were able to restore an earlier, uh, a bit, an earlier representation of what the land looked like before it was developed for the school. And it fixed the flooding issue. And this is incredible with that much work done in a school, especially considering schools are not typically built for this kind of, of long overarching um, educational uh, in innovation. Most schools are built so that, you can't, so that you can't have generational learning. And even if it's generational learning over grade periods. I've already mentioned CMIS, but SEMIS, I have to remind myself that's how we pronounce it here. <laughs> um, in, and this works directly with EMU. It connects schools with community partners with creating a space that is education as collaboration and a pedagogy of, rel of relevance. Students are able to relate to the learning they're doing and be able to make meaning out of what they are learning. And since SEMIS is at EMU, this is one of the greatest features of EMU in my opinion. And I am very biased. 
SEMIS is, uh, ha has our director, uh, Dr. Ethan Lowenstein, who is also in the Place Based Ed Block at the Department of, ed at the Te Department of Teacher Education. And, they, and he personally helped me with this essay um, and dealt with my poor skills as a uh, interviewer. I'm still learning. We all are. And this is part of a trend of EMU being um, an innovator in education, with EMU being one of the oldest teaching colleges in America, especially this side of the Mississippi. And it was a teaching college from the start, and it's at the heart of what we do. I mean, the teaching college is right over there. <laughs> I can see the top of it. <laughs> and EMU has a history of being innovative about it. Currently, Dr. Burke, in the audience, has told me that uh, she aims to allow the College of Education to keep working towards its goals of a lack of compliance with prescribed curriculum, allowing teachers to make their own curriculum and teach the students best, because the prescribed curriculum ultimately does not work with student meaning making. Uh, as my uh, dearest, dearest friend and leader of EMU Next Scholars says, that preparing teachers is is a goal for student-first education. She, uh, created, she and her friend, Dr. Uh, Mrs. J, uh, created Next Scholars uh, to promote place-based education and support minority teachers, another great innovation of the school. And then, of course, Dr. Lowenstein says, community is the center of the education program at EMU. And I cannot, and I cannot stress that enough. It is the truth. EMU works with works with our community to make sure the teachers get the best taste of what they are going into is. And they know that they can teach students the best that they can. Now, of course, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this. This, is, this was the paper I am proudest of in my curriculum. And I am so glad that I am going to be coming back after I take a small hiatus to finish my teaching degree, as I have sadly moved out due to personal pressure but I know I am coming back to something that I know will prepare me for the greatest. And the greatest is that I am going to be an advocate in most likely Southern Indiana for place-based education, and it's gonna reach farther than it already has. Thank you. And I'd also like a round of applause for my teacher, for the help I've gotten from my teachers, Dr. Bavery, Dr. Burke, Dr. Graywall, and Dr. Lowenstein. They need the applause more than I do. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Thanks so much for that wonderful um, presentation. So I'm, I'm curious about how the demographics of a place, right, the diversity of the demographics of a place, might shape, enhance, complicate place-based teaching. With the demography of a place, especially with a widely diverse population, it may hinder the student's ability to be leaders because, uh, speaking from experience, most of the students with a different uh, demographic than the uh, majority of the po uh, population, they tend to be new students, they tend to be immigrants. Uh, this is in my own personal experience that I am speaking. So being able to make a change in their community helps ground them more into the community. And while you may have to work around something like a language barrier, being able to create a universal language of student learning will ultimately help them uh, become the best that they can in their new situations. Uh, I've seen specifically working with uh, Chinese immigrants in the school I substitute for, allowing them to help uh, rebuild the community garden uh, and bring in uh, I'm forgetting the correct word here. Uh, seeds from their home that, would, that could still grow in the garden allowed them to feel more connected to their new community that they are now living. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes. I can hear your passion for place-based learning, place-based education. I'm curious what got you interested in place-based learning in the first place? Uh, you'd have to thank uh, Dr. Graywell for that, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, really helped me feel like education was something I could still do, even after I transitioned out of the education department into a history degree. And she promised me that even if I take a roundabout way, even if I have to hedge my learning as a teacher, I can still do it. 
And through place-based ed, that's not skills that you tend to forget. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot of interpersonal skills and a lot of uh, skills you can apply in other areas. Uh, so even if I uh, quit right now and I come back later, I will still grow as a teacher able to do this because I would have learned and completed these skills outside. And um, she's really great. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? You know my favorite question. What is something you learned that surprised you that you were not expecting? I was very surprised that EMU started the trend. Uh, uh, you know, you don't think of uh, generally the Midwest as a trendsetter usually. We tend to be the flyoveriest of flyover states. Um, so, but even though I knew EMU was one of the earliest teacher colleges uh, that was solely focused on teaching, and that's what I mean when I say this, um, hearing that they are still innovating because place-based education is a quite new concept. Um, it really surprised me, and I'm here like, oh, of course we did after I learned it. I love the meta-ness of that. You gave a place-based answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Once you get into it, you can't unlearn it. <laughs> All right, anything else? Yes? I was wondering what about the 1990s, like the policies that allowed, initially allowed this to kind of take hold or should you find I feel like it, it's more with the migration because it was originally working against policy and now we're aiming to work with the policy that is going in, with standards changing now that ESSA is in uh, effect. And there's more emphasis on uh, learning the arts. Um, that is uh, something that is more capable of sustaining place-based education. All right. All right, thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Gramone Hopkins and I am so excited to introduce our next presenter, um, Arnesia Paul. She has been working really hard on a literature review about the importance of preschool for young children and also looking at um, the barriers that their families face in sending young children to preschool. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for listening in to my presentation. I'm Ernice Paul, majoring in elementary education, early childhood comprehensive. This morning, I'll be presenting to you all my literature review under the mentorship of Dr. Jessica Garome Hopkins, titled The Positive Impact of Preschool, Exploring School and Life Outcomes for Young Children at Attend Preschool. These are some of the topics I focus on for this project. First, it's important to divine, define preschool, which will give us a better sense of the benefits. Moving on, I focus on the barriers families face and who this affects. Then, I focus on the detriments of not attending preschool and how Michigan can support children in attending um, preschool. 
So, before we can understand how preschool affects the school and life outcomes of young children, we first have to understand what early childhood and preschool education is. Early childhood is the period before, between birth to eight years of age. The foundations of a child's development happens during this period. Because children need to have positive experiences during these years, it's common for them to attend early childhood centers. One particular center would be preschool in which a setting that offers an introduction to an academic curriculum geared towards three to five years. Learning skills such as these seen on the screen are critical in young children because it lays the foundation and groundwork for later development and lifelong learning. Now that we know what preschool is, we can understand the benefits of attending early childhood centers such as preschool and pre-K. Through my examination of articles, I have found very common themes regarding the benefits of attending preschool. This includes things such as giving children a more willing attitude and confidence in their processes of learning. It also gives, it's also beneficial to have early exposure to skills such as social emotional, pre-academics, communication and language, and physical and motor skills. In particular, social emotional development lays the foundation of how we feel about ourselves and experience others. These skills are needed to be successful in the classroom and to become successful adults. A quote that I think is important to share, people used to think that children were ready for kindergarten if they could say their ABCs, count, identify colors, write their first name. New brain research is helping us understand that readiness doesn't just mean knowing that academic basis, but having confidence is, is learning giving children a better performance throughout school it completes more years of education. Providing high quality early learning experiences, including pre-kindergarten, helps families prepare their children to achieve and succeed. In a study I read, the data showed participants were nine times more likely to graduate high school and enroll in college and 19% more likely to receive a degree. This builds productive adults that enter a more educated workforce which in turn mean higher incomes, more public revenue, and less poverty and crime. We now understand the benefits of attending preschool and how this can be a positive thing for young children. But unfortunately, there are barriers that families face in being able to provide an early childhood for their child. A study done by the University of Michigan Education Policy Intuitive found that 60% of Michigan four-year-olds are not enrolled in a publicly funded preschool, and 40% do not attend any sort of formal pre-K program. As I continue to, ex to examine the research, I found a few barriers that families face. The first being cost and availability. The average monthly cost for preschool in Michigan is $1,000, $201, and nearly 60% of Michigan families are in households earning only $75,000 or less per year. Next is limited access. This has been an issue for decades in the educational field due to educators feeling overworked and underpaid. The pandemic has even greater impact on this. Data shows that over the past three years, 16,000 licensed child care programs have closed. And thousands of mothers, which are consistently work of mothers, have left and not returned to the workforce. Finally, programs such as the Great Start Readiness Program cover full costs for families earning under $75,000 per year. While this is a good thing, due to factors such as extensive unnecessary paperwork, this could be a barrier to families receiving the funding that they need. These barriers can affect the following people in these groups, which can be families of colors, especially African Americans, single parent households, family with chronic illnesses, and family who are unemployed. And some of the reasons that I got into why would be like logistical challenges, half day programs, health reasons, and difficulty getting children to and from school. Due to the barriers mentioned above and other factors that could prevent children from attending preschool, children can face potential learning and academic detriments. One study showed that children who did not attend preschool slash pre-K fell behind in their math and reading scores in later grades compared to those who did. 
Children who did not attend preschool usually have decreased social skills compared to those who did, which can manifest as not knowing how to collaborate with others and, not, and being more socially withdrawn. Another potential detriment in young children missing out on early childhood special education services. The early years are critical time for educators to identify children who reflect developmentally displaced and disabled and is vital to, prevent, to provide services early in order to provide better outcomes. The detriments I talked about in my last lab can be certainly overcome with support of Michigan. By continuing to make awareness of programs such as Great Start Readiness and Head Start throughout the community in places like Human Resources Office, Community Centers, Doctor's Office, etc., while also making the process for entry into programs such as these accessible. Ensuring parents and guardians are receiving support through barriers that may be troubling them in sending their children to preschool, whether it's through providing more transportation that is specifically for preschool, preschool children, um, making awareness of ECE centers that are offering slider scales, longer preschool hours, etc. Lastly, the prioritization of policy and funding for preschool programs such as universal pre-K should be continued. By 2027, Government Whitmore announced her goal to launch the Pre-K for All program, which will allow all Michigan four-year-olds to attend a free, high-quality pre-K program, regardless of where they live, their race, ethnicity, or how their family, how much their family earns. I would like to give a few thank yous and acknowledgments to those who are a great support to me in this program. My faculty mentor, Dr. Ju Jessica Gloom Hawkins, the EMU Symposium Undergraduate Research Fellows, also known as SURF, the EMU McNair Scholars Program, the director of the EMU McNair Program, Dr. Kimberly Brown, and last but not least, Eastern Michigan University. This is a QR code to my references. Thank you all again for listening into my presentation. is because I, for one, I love being around children for one, and I kind of grew up in a family that had like uh, educators, so I um, got to see how um, impactful and enjoyment she got being in the field, but and then also in my own experiences seeing how the um, education field is and not, not kind of wanting what I experienced throughout school for younger um, children in life. So kind of wanting me to be an educator is um, one of my main goals as far as what I want to be. Thank you. Uh, really nice presentation. Where do you take it next? What would be the, the next step? You know, is there any original research you'd like to connect to collect? Well, yes, actually, because um, when I was doing like the examination of the articles, it made me think as far as um, how does um, children who like attended preschool, um, I'm sorry, I kind of had this kind of, <laughs> but yes, there is further research that I would like to do with this. We have time for more questions. Yeah. Was there a part when you were reading through things, was there, a, was there something in there that surprised you most in what you read? Um, the one thing that surprised me was one of the things that I had mentioned that like 60% of children that are in Michigan aren't enrolled in preschool and 60% that's a huge number so just imagine just um, as they go in the um, grade school and later on how that could affect them. So I guess that's the one thing that surprised me the most. Still 
have some more time. Do you make a <laughs> distinction between a preschool program and a daycare program? Yes, there is. So like I mentioned in my slide before, preschool is more of like an academic um, environment where um, they are like learning on their skills of like cognitive skills and um, fine motor, um, physical motor, like, um, you know, like more like their masks, stuff of that nature, but where like the daycare is more of a service where, um, say if like a family has to go work or anything of that nature, it's more of an environment where children can be dropped off and have like a kind of caring environment that they know that they're gonna be okay in. If you were to advocate for certain kinds of early childhood practices, what would those be? That's a really interesting question I never thought of before. But I'm really not sure because there's a lot that it is to advocate for because there's so much within the, um, especially the early childhood um, things that are going on. So maybe once I figure that out, I will answer that question. But thank you. Though. I have a question. So my little one right now is actually in pre-K, but um, I didn't notice when I was looking for the next step, there are a lot of middle ground programs, such as a uh, great start readiness program that you mentioned. There's Young Fires, and um, there's just an opportunity to do pre-K again, depending on the age. Do you think that um, with working as programmers on the available to all four-year-olds, that they should extend some of, like right now there's time guards where you have to turn four or five by certain age limits, do you think they should extend that or do you think they should keep that in place so that the children are um, still going by the, the social standards or do you think academically it makes sense for them to like progress? And that's a, that's a very loaded question. So <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, I, I like that question because it's something that I never thought of. But as far as like what you said about um, expanding, um, I think as of right now, I think it would be good if they keep it as to where it's at because like that's in their time um, development is really critical for that. So I think as far as what you just said, I think that they should keep it to where it's at. Thank you all again. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Margo. Um, I am a, a senior, I guess. I don't know, super senior. I don't know what you want to call me. But um, um, I did some research on late discovery student experiences with le learning disability diagnoses. So to start, um, I just wanted to give a definition of what learning disabilities could be defined as because I'm going to reference them a lot throughout the presentation. Um, so when I talk about learning disabilities, I'm talking about four different learning disabilities, um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, um, dyslexia, a reading disability, dysgraphia, a writing and spelling disability, and dyscalculia, a mathematics disability. So my motivation for my study derives from my personal experience. I was diagnosed with ADHD in seventh grade, and just last year at age 24, I was diagnosed with um, a language disorder, a receptive and expressive language disorder, and I'm actually also in the process with getting diagnosed for dyslexia. 
So I got the whole thing going on. <laughs> um, but yeah, right? <laughs> um, but getting diagnosed this late in life is actually quite rare. Typically that's something that gets diagnosed as a kid. Um, so having these late diagnoses really made me wonder, why didn't I get diagnosed earlier and what prevented me from getting the supports that I so desperately needed in school to be successful? When I, um, because of this, I looked, decided to look into some data because I had no reference point, right? And so I looked into some data and I honestly didn't find much. And by looking into this data, it made me realize I was in the minority with my experience. And because of this, it made me want to bring light, this problem to light in the education system, which brings me now to my research question. Among people whose disabilities were not identified until high school or later, how did they characterize their learning experience? So like I said, there's not a lot of literature on these people's experiences, but these are a couple things that I did find. Um, so Sparks and Lovett of 2009 did um, a study on how college students with disabilities perform to their non-disabled peers, and they found that they had actually had average grades compared to their peers, um, and they had a lack of consensus on how to diagnose these students later in life. Canto, Proctor, and Previtt 2005 did a study um, on educational outcomes of students first diagnosed with a learning disability in post-secondary schools. And they found that there's actually no difference in student success based on the supports that they receive from their school, which I find really interesting because that's the whole point of having those accommodations is to make it fair and equitable. But it actually just didn't really do much for those students. And last but not least, uh, National Joint Committee in 1983 um, did a study on mental health needs of adults with learning disabilities. And they found that there's poor information regarding mental health and there's actually no awareness on the social and emotional um, problems that these students go through. So, as you can see, we're not working with a lot here. So this made me want to dive into this research and kind of see if we can find some answers. So now that you kind of understand the motivation and foundation of my study, I kind of want to dive into my data collection. So first I, got I had to go get approval from the IRB, which is the place that tells me if my study is ethical and if I can perform it or not. Let me tell you, this process took me forever. <laughs> but once I finally got it approved, I decided to do 30-minute um, interviews. And to participate in my study, the only requirement was you had to be diagnosed with a learning disability in high school or college. I ended up getting eight participants, seven women and one man. And I then recorded those interviews and transcribed them. Once I trans had those transcriptions, um, I used a special type of research data process called coding. Um, super new to it, it's super interesting, there's so many different ways that you can code, but I chose a way called in vivo coding. And it's basically a process where you take direct quotes from the participants and use that as your primary data. Once I had those codes, I cut them out. Oh my gosh, so many cutting. <laughs> Printed them out, cut them out, organized them, put them into common themes, and found my, um, my explored those themes to get my results. So what I found was there's 239 codes using in vivo coding, and 17 themes emerged from those codes. And this is just a list of those, co uh, those themes, so I'll give you a second to read those over. I don't need to read them all, but there's a lot of them. Oh, yep, of course. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple main ones that I found particularly really interesting that I wanted to explore with you today. And the first one being public stigma and common fears. So overall, all my participants pretty much had a negative social stigma with getting diagnosed later in life. They felt that it could be detrimental for them, uh, whatever reason that was for them. Um, they also never considered having a learning disability as an option for them. They knew they struggled, they had average grades, they, they didn't, you know, how they weren't like super off in the wayside where they really, it was obvious that they needed help. They knew they struggled, but they couldn't really put their finger on it, right? They, they, were, they were struggling, but not excelling. Um, because of this, coping strategies emerged for all participants, um, and it created secondary problems for them. So for example, it could have been lack of energy and sleep, or it could have been extreme procrastination, but everybody had something. But what I found particularly interesting on this one was everyone had to be self-advocates for themselves. They went to therapists, psychologists, doctors, friends and family, and they brought this issue to them and said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but something, this is my experience. No one ever identified it within them, and that's, so they had to be self-advocates for themselves at the beginning of that process. Even during and after the process, they had to be advocates for themselves. They had to advocate to get tested. There was a lot of people who had problems getting tested um, and even getting accommodations at their school. 
Some of my participants even opted out of getting part, um, accommodations at their school because they were met with so many roadblocks that it just wasn't worth it for them. So just to put it into a visual for you, 87% of my participants felt a negative social stigma with getting a di disability diagnosis later in life. And even though 87% felt that negative social stigma, 75% felt relieved and validated when they got that diagnosis, which I thought was particularly interesting. They finally had an answer to why they felt this way, and they had validation for why school was so demanding for them. And on top of that all, 62% they felt they got missed, sorry, 62% felt they got missed because they presented differently. So for example, in ADHD, it can present very differently in females and males. So for males, it can present very um, outward, very um, behavioral, right, very um, hyperactive. But for females, it can be typically more internal, right? They're dealing with it. So even though both are labeled as ADHD, they present differently and they felt just for that reason alone, they got missed. So the second theme that I want to explore is mental health. And to be quite honest with you, this was not a theme that I expected to come out at all because I didn't ask a question about this. 90% um, of my participants mentioned mental health being related to their late diagnosis, which once again, I didn't prompt anything for this. They just brought it up within their interviews. These are some of the codes that I was talking about of direct quotes from my participants. So they felt they were always pushing themselves, but always still slipping through the cracks. Um, it was very challenging, difficult, and depressing. They were masking a lot, and they felt like they were a fake. But diving even deeper, the, a theme that came out was anxiety and depression. So whether that was a misdiagnosis or being diagnosed at the same time, 62% of my participants explained a correlation of having anxiety and depression related to being diagnosed later in life. And the last theme I wanted to explore was the positive impacts in the classroom. So one of the questions I asked in my interview was, what is your favorite class that you've ever had and what did the teacher do specifically that made you enjoy that class so much? And these were the three themes that emerged from that. Um, engage, so the first one being engaging interactive, the teachers framed things in multiple modalities. So students had access to the information in multiple different ways, right? So they could watch a video, they could read a paper, they could listen to the lecture. They had different ways of accessing that information. Um, there was room for creativity. They felt like they had a say in the classroom. So this could be the teacher allowed them, instead of taking a test to express their knowledge, they were able to do a presentation, they could make a poster, they could write a paper, right? They had different avenues of being creative in the classroom to express their knowledge. And lastly, they were cared about on a personal level. They felt that their educators were accommodating and cared about them more than just the surface. So these teachers got to know them personally. They got to know what they were doing after school, what their home life was like, what their strengths, their weaknesses are, more than just being a student. And for the same question, I honestly predicted that everyone was going to be like, an elective class, right? Like, that's my favorite. And I was like, that was not the case at all. Everyone actually said a core subject. They said a language class, a math class, an English class, a science class. But what the common theme was, was that these teachers were inclusive. They were teaching in those modalities that I just talked about on the last slide. They were inclusive. So these are some more codes. Um, that participants talked about. So they were tackling, for these teachers, um, they were tackling ideas um, to form, sorry, they were tackling an idea from a lot of different angles. They had free range over their thoughts. Certain educators understood their struggle. They cared about us as people and engaging with the material in a way that made sense to us. So why is this so important? So for my findings, for the first theme, participants had to seek help to be identified because there was no outside help, which led to those common fears I discussed. And for the second theme, living with an undiagnosed learning disability affected their mental health to where their coping strategies emerged, and um, yeah, to where coping strategies emerged, and they had to mask their symptoms. And what I was really surprised about for this theme was everyone felt this way. This was a common theme throughout all my participants. And last but not least, it's not about the subject that we're teaching. It's about the relationships that we're building to create a safe and equitable classroom for all learners. So we know there's no way we can catch everyone, right? It's our goal as educators to diagnose early and to catch these students, right? That's our goal. But we know we can't catch everyone. So what do we do to minimize this gap? I think we need to meet students where they're at, right? If we teach inclusively, we can reach all learners regardless of them being neurodivergent or not. 
there's also principal frameworks out there in the world called like UDL. UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. And it's just a way to teach accessibly to all learners so that you can give these students the access to these materials in multiple modalities. So if we're using these frameworks and we're using the meeting students where they're at, I think this can minimize the gap significantly. So there were a couple limitations with my study. Um, first being that everyone was diagnosed with ADHD, so I didn't have any um, other dis disabilities. I didn't have any dyslexia, dysgraphia, or dyscalculus uh, participants. Um, it was also a small study. I only had a short amount of time, so I only had eight participants. And in those eight participants, I only had one man and one person of color. Um, on top of that all, most of my participants were EMU students. So I would love to do this study again with a wider range of disabilities, um, a larger pool, and more diversity. So thank you so much for letting me uh, present to you today. This is something I've been extremely passionate about and extremely excited to do. So I can't thank you enough for listening. Um, I want to say thank you to my friends and family because they have listened to me say the speech so many times <laughs> and have helped me work out the nitty gritty. And then also um, my advisor, Dr. Rebecca Lewick, she's met with me every week and answered every single question I could ever come up with. She is phenomenal and I can't thank her enough. So thank you so much. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Or? We have time for one, quest one or two questions. Yeah. As someone who was also diagnosed with ADHD very late in my life, good old fashioned getting diagnosed at 20. Yep. <laughs> um, was there, did any of your participants ever state like their mental health had an effect on their physical health and their physical performance in the classroom? No one mentioned a physical component. Um, it was mainly just that emotional, because it was all internal, right? They didn't know what was going on with them, so it was more of a mental, a mental thing. Yeah, I only ask because with me, if I panic enough, I give myself the flu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. In the extent research that you read to prepare for the, the sure. empirical study, um, are there any known sort of demographic patterns for late, later diagnosis? Does it tend to fall more toward women than men or more toward people of color or communities in poverty or anything like that? Sure, I'm not sure about what group is mainly, but I know that women are missed a lot specifically. Um, a lot of the reason because they present differently um, and also um, like, uh, I'm trying to think of the words to say this, but yeah, just women just present differently, and I think that's mainly the group that gets missed. Um, I also think there's a lot of there's problems with people of color as well getting the access to those resources to get diagnosed and to get that information. Um, but I haven't, I didn't read anything specifically because, like I said, there wasn't a lot out there, so I had to do some digging. <laughs> but thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Caroline Demu, and today I'll be talking to you about the impact of implicit bias in early childhood education. I first wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk to you about this today, and also thank you to Dr. Bailly for supporting me as I research throughout the semester. So first, I want to discuss what is implicit bias and where do we see it in our daily lives? So Harvard professor Mazarin Banaji defined implicit bias as referring to judgments made without conscious awareness about a person, based on groupable features such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, social status, sexuality, and more. So where do we see it in our daily lives? 
It's important to note biases can be triggered by emotions. So we can see these biases come out in politics, interactions in the grocery store, when we're stuck in traffic. But these biases can also make us vulnerable. Oops. Okay. I have not considered my own implicit biases until I learned about this concept in Dr. Bayou's class last semester. Everyone has their own implicit biases due to their own unique lived experiences. So I'd like to do an interactive portion. If you feel comfortable, I'd like you to raise your hand when I list these examples of biases. So if you have ever felt the cultural bias of being stereotyped based on your culture or having negative assumptions made about your interests or your dislike based on your culture, please raise your hand. Thank you. Social biases. If you have ever misinterpreted a social cue and felt feelings of shame or embarrassment, I know I definitely have. Thank you. Gender biases. If you have ever heard the sayings, you throw like a girl, boys don't cry, or you're just being emotional, please raise your hand. Economic biases. If you have ever had a distinction about your character made based on the clothing that you wear, your source of transportation, your source of income, please raise your hand. Thank you. These biases can cause us to feel uncomfortable and feel ashamed of our strength and sensitivity. And if us as adults are feeling these biases, we need to consider how the children in our educational settings are experiencing these biases as well. So I first want to talk about how implicit bias impacts assessment. So our biases can translate into assessment data. The Leaders Project of Columbia University published an article saying, Children from different linguistic or cultural backgrounds may not have had the exposure to the ideas or knowledge that a test assessor is expecting. This can in turn increase the rates of children that are being referred for special education services when they're not needed. This can create flaws in the testing system. Okay, so early childhood education focuses mainly on child assessor interaction versus child and physical test interaction. So I have the blue block example. So I as the assessor have set out materials a bunch of different colored blocks in front of me, and I have a child with me, and I ask the child, do you know which block is blue? The child does not respond. So again, I ask, do you know which block is blue? Again, the child does not respond, because at home, agreeing means to remain respectfully silent, while disagreeing means to speak up. I, as the assessor, mark that the child does not know which block is blue, and I move on. This impacts their assessment data, but it can be avoided. We can identify cultural informants or members or families of the community or members of the community or family members that can discuss which behaviors are expected within a certain culture. We can also restructure questions to guide children to the answer, like saying, pick up the block that is blue, or please point to the block that is blue, instead of saying, do you know? The leaders project also said that this impacts what children think about their own abilities. They said, if an assessor is continually marking a child's development or skills lower than they actually are, the child may lower their own expectations of achievement. This can cause misconceptions to grow about certain people and cultures, and in turn, less opportunities are provided and children fall into a stigma that was created by those with a lack of knowledge about culture. So this also translates into our observation of children. The way that we observe children can be flawed. The Schubert Center for Child Studies performed a research and it said that implicit bias in observation relates to racial discrimination. It was found that for black children and for specifically black boys, they are more prejudiced to be unruly and aggressive. Not only does this impact their self-esteem, but it impacts the amount of support that they receive and the discipline that they receive. The Child Care Service Association published a video observation study in which they asked preschool teachers to watch a video of children playing. They were told to look at these children and identify potential bad behaviors before they began. The children in this video were of different races and genders. There was also an eye tracking device installed to see which children the teachers were spending the most time looking at. The children in this video were child actors and there was no potential bad behavior whatsoever in the entire video. However, the results showed that more time teachers spent looking at boys and at black children over girls and white children for potential bad behavior. It was identified that 43% of the time teachers looked to black boys, 33% of the time teachers looked to white boys, 13% of the time teachers looked to black girls, and 11% of the time teachers look, or white girls, and 11% of the time teachers look to black girls. 
This is a direct example of how our observation impacts, or how our implicit bias impacts observation. The Schubert Center for Child Study said, as teacher and student reports of perceived conflict improve, student performance improves. Providing culturally responsive support to both teachers and students may help to moderate the stressful effects of prejudice and discrimination on educational achievement. When a teacher's bias impacts the way that we observe children, it also affects their relationships with children and the children's family. The National Association for the Education of Young Children produced a anti-bias educational framework. It has four core goals, identity, diversity, justice, and activism. It is evident that teachers who hold biases against students spend less quality time with them and therefore provide less developmental support for these children. The National Association of Education of Young Children also has four goals of how teachers should interact with children to create beneficial relationships and trusting connections. These four goals are, teachers will nurture each child's construction of knowledgeable, confident, individual, personal, and social identities. Teachers will promote each child's comfortable, empathetic interaction with people from diverse backgrounds. This next one is very important because, like I said, we all have implicit biases. Teachers will foster each child's capacity to critically identify bias and will nurture each child's empathy for the hurt that bias causes. And lastly, teachers will cultivate each child's ability and confidence to stand up for oneself and others in the face of bias. It is so important to recognize our own biases because children will model the behaviors that they see adults represent. When, when educators take the time to learn about children and their family, a safe and constructive learning environment is created that sets a foundation for how children should treat themselves and others. Now, I know this sounds like a whole lot of negative, but we can do our part. So, how can we recognize and minimize bias? The first step we can take is just having awareness that bias exists. We can have our own mental health consultations to understand the why behind our implicit bias. We can also take online bias tests and bias training before beginning work with children and families. We can understand that having a lack of knowledge creates biases. So the more knowledgeable we are about cultural and gender stereotypes, social and economic values and structures, the, more, the less likely we are to be biased against them. And lastly, just making all students feel seen in the classroom. This can be done using music, art, books, and activities that highlight different people, identities, and cultures. This picture I have on the slide is actually in this book. It is called You, Me, and Empathy. It's by Janine Sanders. Not only is the message in this book great, but it depicts children from different cultures and races and genders and abilities. And having these kind of materials in the classroom really make children feel seen and minimize the impact of our bias. So I appreciate you listening to me talk to you about this today, and I am open to taking any questions that you may have. Time for about three, four questions. Okay. One of the jobs that you Thank you. And my question is, I'm thinking about my own presentation kind of like, and do you think um, implicit bias kind of has like an effect on children attending like early child syndrome? Oh, for sure. I mean, just, just just the biases that children experience, and also it could be the biases that their parents have experienced, they might not want to put their child into that setting. So it could definitely decrease the rates of children going into early childhood centers because of that, yeah. Questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all, for attending this session. We are done. Have a good rest of your day. Enjoy the other sentence.
So tell me your name and tell me a little bit about your project today. Hi, my name is Brianna Ressler and um, my project is a 3D poster. Hey guys, it's Jules D. Shetler. We're here at the 44th Annual Undergraduate Symposium. We're going to be interviewing presenters. We have the Design Expo, poster boards, orals. I hope uh, no, you're good. Just, just speak off on the mind. And if you mess up, it's, it's like I said, it's only three questions and it's okay. Um, ready? Okay, what's your name and what's your project about today? Um, I'm Sarah. And so my project is about human genetics. Um, we look at the a specific alu element, which is t has 10,000 copies in the human DNA. And we look at the mutated, mutated form and the ancestor cool form. And then do human population studies from there. Wow, interesting. Can you tell us a little, like, a fun fact that you learned throughout this process? So, PCR is actually a very cost-effective way that we learn about humans, and we can apply it in so many different ways, and I didn't know that such a simple thing we can take and learn so much about, like, our DNA and humans in general. Why did you originally choose this topic to research? Um, I went to the undergraduate um, research kind of um, Zoom and Dr. Cass was talking about his research about human genetics and so it was basically it just piqued my interest a lot because we get to learn about the humans as like a whole and ethnicities and how we evolved over time so that really interested me. What kind of expectations do you have throughout the day? Do you have any uh, desires? Are you kind of just going into it blind? What's going on for today? Um, this is actually like my second time doing a poster presentation. So I'm just excited to get to show off um, all the work that we've gotten since then. Since you did say this is your second time, uh, what kind of changes or differences have you seen from so far this symposium than last year's? I think there's um, a lot more people coming in, a lot more people interested about the research, so I'm very excited to see that. All right, thank you so much and good luck today with everything. Thank you. <laughs> Can you tell me your name and a little bit about your project today? Uh, my name is Alvaro Cobos, and what I've been working on is an organic synthesis of a monomer. Uh, that will hopefully allow us to perform uh, organic reactions in water instead of organic solvents, which can be very toxic and polluting to the environment. Yeah. And how long have you been working on this? Uh, I've been working on this since uh, last summer. I took a so uh, semester in the summer and these past two semesters. Yeah. So what did you find out from your research that you can share with us today? Uh, I found out that it's a very difficult process. Well, there's a lot of changes that you have to make uh, in organic synthesis. Things may not work. You may have to uh, <clears throat> uh, change what was done in procedure because in practice, a lot of these things that should be easy in theory aren't always so easy. So what do you kind of want your audience to take away from this? Like, what's the main message? Uh, hopefully, what we're trying to do is make organic chemistry much more environmentally friendly, uh, reduce the pollutants out there, and, uh, you know, provide a promising path forward uh, so that these reactions can occur without the use of just toxic things that will be bad for the environment. Interesting. Good point. Um, is this your first time presenting at the undergraduate symposium? Uh, yeah, this is my first time. All right. Then you have a good luck with this. Uh, best of luck, and I really thank you for interviewing. Thank you. Tell me your name and a little bit about your project. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Eager, and my project is focusing on uh, antibiotic resistance, specifically the effects of Herbisanta against Staph aureus. Okay, so can you tell me like, the, what is that difference and what exactly that means? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think we're all kind of familiar with bacterial diseases, right? You all had maybe strep throat before. They give you an antibiotic and you're good to go. Well, there's a lot of bacteria out there that are kind of evading the antibiotics. They've gotten sick of getting killed, so they've come up with some resistance mechanisms. And a big threat right now is MRSA, which is a methylene-resistant Staph aureus. Um, and so for that strain, that's specifically what I was testing against. Um, I was using a plant-derived compound, like I mentioned, Herbisanta. Um, which has just not been tested a lot on before, but it was really interesting to see the inhibitory and sidal effects that it was having on this dangerous strain of Staph aureus. What did you find? Like, what was your results of this research? You know, there were a lot of researchers or student researchers before me, and even a few that are coming after. And so my result is more significant in helping them. Um, I kind of nitpicked the recipe for the compounds we were using and found a few flaws in them that were really kind of invalidating some research that even I did. 
Um, and so being able to send those new findings forward and also kind of just make suggestions for further researchers to grow with this. Um, you know, like I said, we found that it inhibited and it killed and those are all great things, but mostly just helping further researchers perfect the way to do it, I guess. And what do you want your audience when they come to your poster board today, what do you want them to take away from it? You know, I just like them to take away the big idea of antibiotic resistance in general. Um, I'm going to PA school in the fall, and so I'm really interested in medicine and helping people, obviously. And a big part of that is when things don't work, we have to find alternate solutions. And I think the more people that become aware that there are issues, the more people will have helping find these alternate solutions, I guess. Perfect. Thank you so much, and good luck today. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Can you tell us your name and a little bit about your project today? Uh, my name is Jamie Williams, and my project is about silver nanoparticles and silver nanoclusters and their fluorescence effects and how this can be used to sense biomolecules. So what did you find out from your research? Um, we found out that silver nanoclusters' fluorescence would increase with glucose, but we couldn't find any consistency with um, riboflavin vitamin B2's uh, fluorescence when in contact with silver nanoparticles. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, we just couldn't really find anything consistent from our data. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why your data was, didn't find a conclusion? It's a very like delicate process. Um, trying to get the solution to fluoresce was pretty hard, and trying to control its agglomeration, which controls kind of its fluorescence in a way, was very like delicate. It was based on pH, and we couldn't really control the pH of the solution at the time. So a lot of the way, like, our data was iffy because, like, making everything was very hard and we came into a lot of, like, roadblocks. So now that you know that and now that the symposium day is here, what is your kind of, like, your next step? What is your result, like, your long-term goal from this? Um, I did this project last semester and it was very interesting to me, but I've since, like, gone to a different department of research. Okay. But Dr. Burra is still continuing the research on this with his other students. And he is going to study more between the fluorescent riboflavin and silver nanoparticles and like different ways to synthesize everything to try and see if that's the reason why our data wasn't really good or not. But um, different synthesis and maybe different biomolecules to try and like biosense in a way. Okay, so the research is not done. You guys are still going to continue this. Research is never done. We're always going. <laughs> good point. Perfect. Uh, good luck today, and thank you for the interview. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day. Can you tell me your name and what your project's about today? Mm -hmm. My name is Jude, and my project is a simulation model that simulates the upper atmosphere of Mars. Um, I tried to show that, it's, that this model provides simulations that are consistent with actual data that was collected by NASA's spacecraft. How long have you been working on this? I have been working on this for a while. It's been like two years, I think. But I started working on the actual project for like this, like three months ago. So was it, were you researching it for fun or was it always the intent of presenting it at the symposium today? Um, I was doing it for fun when I started and I also get paid to do it. <laughs> so, but then um, I heard about the symposium and I was like, let's just present it there. And then I started working for the symposium specifically. So tell me a little bit about your research. What did you find out from all of this? So I found out that it's, that atmospheres are really hard to predict and that our model is really consistent with uh, simulating the atmosphere of Mars, a planet that we know very little about because we've never been there. So um, I simulated the, uh, those simulations and I also found out that um, two, uh, two Earth years are one, Mar uh, one Martian year, which is interesting. And I also found out that um, you know, the seasons on Earth, they depend on the tilt of Earth. But the seasons on Mars, they don't depend on the tilt. They depend on the distance from the sun, which is really interesting. Because on Earth, when we're closer, closest to the sun, we get winter. It's the other way around. On Mars, if, if they're closest to the uh, sun, they get uh, summer. Which is, which is really interesting. Yeah. I agree, that is interesting. Um, so you said you've been working on this for a while. Can you tell me what your favorite part about this whole process was? Well, my favorite part was able being able to access NASA's computers, because <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, because it's actually my goal to like work as an engineer for NASA, 
I got access to their computers because this is not really like a thing that you can run on your normal computer. You have like very, you need very high computing ends. So I had to access their computers remotely and run myself, and I, I could like contact NASA's people, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. Thank you so much for joining me and answering these questions, and I hope you good luck today. Thank you. Yeah, Okay, what's your name? And tell me a little about your project. It's really colorful, it's catching my eye. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ari Gentry. Uh, I'm a computer science major, and I worked alongside Dr. Elsa Poe to work on this uh, messaging application that works over UDP networking sockets. Basically, UDP is a system that two, two computers have to agree upon in order to send electrical signals to each other. So if you send, if you send messages to another computer using a different protocol, uh, it won't know what to do with them. Okay. So, a messaging, our messaging application here is trying to be secure at every step of the process. So logging in, you have to register with a two-factor authentication service. Just like if you're logging into Gmail and you get that text with the code, it's exactly that. You have to reply with the code and ensure your identity before you can even access your messages. And then every single message is encrypted using RSA end-to-end -end encryption. So even if there was like a server leak and all the messages got out into the public, there's absolutely no way of reading them unless you are the intended recipient or if you spend like billions of years brute forcing trying to figure out what the messages say. And even still, the messages are so small that it probably doesn't have that, that, that important data in there. So this is actually a very simplified version of a commercial application. Anything larger than this, like an actual emailing system, uh, there would be many more steps to this. This is, this is just something I was able to produce during class, basically. OK, yeah. So it looks like it has like a lot of coding, like you were saying. So what would you say was the most challenging part about this process? Uh, this was my first time working with internet-based programming, but also it was my first time programming in the C language. So I had to learn an entirely new language in order to do this project. But uh, I'm glad I did because I'm, I'm very familiar with it now. Yeah. Uh, how long have you took? Like, how long was the entire process? When did you start and from today? Oh, uh, I started working on this project in, I believe, the middle of October, and the, or sorry, no, the start of October. This was turned into class around the middle of November, I believe. So it took around five to six weeks and about 65, 70 hours outside of class to do it. Oh wow. Yeah. So. Like you said, outside of class, you have a lot of research here. So how did you balance doing the research uh, while still keeping up with your regular classes? Oh, I went to my professor's office hours. I, I would not have been able to do this without her help. Uh, and this, this is also something that I probably wouldn't have pursued on my own outside of doing it for a class. I'm very glad that I learned it, but I don't know if I have the willpower to do this without getting a grade on it. So she, she was a huge help. She, did, she, she really helped me with every single step of the way because I was very unfamiliar with it. So you obviously got your grade in class, but you also chose to take it a little further by presenting. So what do you expect to come uh, after the symposium? Uh, after the symposium, uh, I'm not exactly sure if I will do anything with this project in particular. I'm glad that I have this skill set, um, being able to work with networking. Uh, it's very specifically a networking course at EMU. And without taking that course, I don't know if I would have been able to even apply any of my programming knowledge on the like over the internet at all. So if, if any company ever wanted to hire me and wanted, wanted me to work on an actual messaging client and I hadn't done this project, I probably would have been like, give me six weeks to figure it out, 60 hours outside of work, and then maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to figure it out. Right. Well, now you're ahead of the game. So uh, thank you for speaking with me, and good luck today. Thank you very thank much you. for interviewing me. Of course, thank you. Today I'm here with Jason. Uh, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your project today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my project today is involved in the simulation of hair, fur, and cloth using the um, requisite program that we use in the uh, SAG program, Autodesk Maya, and basically how we go through the movements of uh, creating those simulations for um, animation. And how did you originally come up with this idea? Like, what, uh, what inspired you? So um, I think what originally inspired me is the fact that um, our SAG program, despite having you know simulation right at the beginning of the name, we only have about one simulation uh, class that we take, and it's simulation animation dynamic, and it focuses more on um, you know liquid and gas, and you know it touches on you know the cloth and sometimes some more physics, but it doesn't really go into any. Um, hair or fur, or fur simulation that you can really dig deep into. So speaking of hair, and I can see here on the TV, what would you say is the easiest kind of hair to replicate? I think the easiest kind of hair to replicate is just um, whatever the most 
basic um, form of hair is, which is usually just straight. And that's usually how it starts when you um, begin to uh, simulate it and place it on the head, is that it'll come out as a straight curve. So you can get, you know, sticking straight up hair right off the bat, but, you know, generally you'll want to start curling it and adjusting it so it actually looks like real hair. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting, and good luck today with everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me your name and tell me a little bit about your project today. Uh, my name's Lindsay, um, and these are my two projects. Uh, the first one is an animation that I made with uh, one of my classes that I was the project lead for, um, and then I edited the final video. Um, and then my second project um, is about character rigging. Um, I compared two different um, types of rigging, one the more basic skin bind, um, and then the other is muscle simulation. So it, you make little fake muscles and then it moves the oh. stuff. So. That's really interesting. Uh, how long have you been working on these projects? Ooh, um, the animation was last semester. Um, I was working on it for maybe 10 weeks, and then the rest of the class joined in for like the last six to put their animations in. Um, and then my character rigging one uh, has been three months, uh, yeah. So you've definitely put some time into this. So uh, what initially sparked your interest in this topic? Um, like animation stuff in general? Yeah. Or? Oh, uh, I've really liked animated movies and I really like playing video games. So all the little animations and cool effects and stuff in there, I was like, I want to make those. So now I am. <laughs> Thank you for talking with me. Your topic's very interesting. Good luck today. Hi, can you tell us your name today and tell me a little bit about your research project? Absolutely, my name is Olivia Robinson. I'm a senior here at Eastern Michigan University. And my project is uh, basically talking about the Hebrew Bible and the covenantal literature that is occurring in Genesis. So I have taken two famous stories in the Hebrew Bible. I've translated them into a more universal language, which is mathematics, so the Noahide and Abrahamic covenants. Interesting, okay, so what initially sparked this interest and how long have you been working on it? Yes, so I studied at the University of Oxford through the Eastern Opus Partnership in 2023. Um, through that tutor, I started learning about Israel's covenant. And then after that, uh, this entire year, I've been working with Dr. Irwin in the uh, Department of uh, History and Philosophy, and basically have been working for a full year on this paper, on this idea. Um, and I'm just so thrilled that they were able to give me so much guidance and support with this project. Of course. Um, what would you say was the most challenging part about this entire process? Um, I think it was uh, accessing all of the sources that I needed. Um, there was a lot of um, sources that I was utilizing that had a lot of um, I guess difficult language to process, uh, a lot of Hebrew, um, a lot of secondary sources, um, and so finding the time to really work through all of that literature, it was difficult, but I managed. <laughs> Is there anything super cool or interesting that you learned throughout this process that you would like to share with us today? Um, I guess uh, don't doubt that ideas can uh, be completely new and correct. Um, so I, for example, with the Abrahamic Covenant, included say, uh, Hagar and Sarah. And they are two biblical figures that are not always mentioned in the Abrahamic Covenant because it's a patriarchal society and literature piece. Um, but when you look at the evidence, I think that they are an integral part of that story. And so being able to convey that was a real gift um, for me to be able to work on. Thank you for teaching me something new and thank you for your time today. Of course, thank thank you. you. Okay, can you tell me your name and a little bit about today's uh, research that you've done? Yeah, so uh, my name is Matthew Lansdale and currently I'm researching epigenetics in the Alba lab. I've been working there for about three semesters. Uh, and if you see here, we're just researching specific proteins, UHRF1 and 2. Uh, which are really common in cancers, and we're looking to inhibit those maybe for some drug development. So how long have you been working uh, throughout this whole process? Uh, so for this, I work about, I want to say, five to six hours a week on top of everything else that's going on. It's about as much as I can fit in my schedule, uh, but about five to six hours a week just running the FP assays, and then I meet with Dr. Alba every week to kind of interpret the data and get some results. So you meet with your mentor or your faculty uh, weekly, so how have they kind of prepared you so that you're ready for today? 
Yeah, so on a Wednesday, we actually all met as a lab. It was really great, and uh, we ran through the posters with each other, and because we have pretty similar knowledge of these proteins, we ended up talking about like what we could have done better, what we could ask, and then we ended up asking a lot of questions uh, because a few of members of our lab are actually going down to Texas this weekend, including myself, for the uh, ASBMB, which is a molecular biology and biochemistry conference, so we were kind of prepping for that as well. That's really cool. Um, in your opinion, what do you think the value of undergraduate research is? I think it's absolutely like just a knowledge based thing, but it's also a very big confidence builder. I think there's this stigma where people think, oh, maybe I don't belong here, maybe I'm, you know, not good enough to be here, and that's just never the case. You know, I know a lot about the things I research, people know a lot of the things about the things they research, and it's really about just building yourself up as like an academic and a person and a researcher and just kind of moving forward with that into professionalism. So overall, after you're presenting today, what do you want your audience to take away from your research? Uh, I would like them to know that there are things being done about cancer in the world. Obviously, it's, it's such a large issue, uh, but even down to the smallest scale of just researching small proteins that could have small effects, but if you have 100 people making a small effect, that's 100 small effects, it kind of builds up over time, right? So I think there's just a little bit of hope in everybody's research today that the world is moving in the right direction and it's getting better. So. Good points, good points. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me, and uh, good luck today. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name today and what's your uh, project topic? Okay, my name is Manal Chishti and my project is about effects of EDTA in production of antimicrobial properties of bacteria. So what was your kind of your conclusion? What did you find? So basically we found like if we add more EDTA in the um, bacterial plate, they will be we're hoping to see more um, antimicrobial production and it will induce more antimicrobial production. But the thing is that it's something that we have to further explore because it it works for some strains and it doesn't work for other strains. Is there a reason why? Um, that's something we want to uh, research a little bit more because we're thinking, like, okay, what if we add a little bit more EDTA in the media later on? Or maybe like we should add a little bit earlier or like should we like, change like some things? So I think it's something that's very subjective at this point and we have to like still continue exploring that because we have seen good growth in one of the strains. But like, what is specifically in that strain that we don't see in other strains? Right. Hmm. Uh, what would you say the biggest challenge of this entire process was? I think the biggest thing is like just understanding everything. Because as undergrads, like I feel like research is very different from like actually studying in class. Whatever you study in class, it's kind of more different. Like when you're yeah. researching, it's kind of like studying something totally new. And like going from basics to like all this advanced stuff because PhD level stuff and they're like and these professors are like oh you have to do this but like oh but what, I'm, what am I supposed to do so I think the whole thing is like just understanding the whole topic of like how it all connects together like all the classes you've been taking separately in semesters putting them together to make one thing work and you brought up the the difference of undergrad research so why do you think it's important that EMU focuses on undergrad research rather than just grad research? I think undergrad research is nicer because um, it gives you like a head start of like okay why do why am I supposed to be taking all these general classes why am I supposed to be spending like four years in like college and then like going and then still having to go to grad school right and then in grad school you're just like over one but like, okay how am I supposed to apply this together so I think like doing research undergrad you're able to apply that information from the beginning, so it's kind of like a head start. You know what you're doing, you're getting yourself into for grad school, and more experience about what you want to do in grad school, and if this the path you want to go to or not. Right. That is true. Now, in your uh, situation, what is your next step? Do you want to continue your research, go to grad school? Uh, I know that the symposium offers scholarships after presentation. So, what's your next step? For me, next step definitely continuing this project. Try to like find more about it and hopefully getting to a good part, uh, place where I can hopefully publish something with Dr. Price. But after graduation, I'm definitely hoping to like apply to medical school and do relief work. That's like my big time dream. <laughs> well, good luck with that and thank you so much for this interview. So yeah, of course, you. thank you. Hi, can you tell me your name and tell me a little bit about your guys' project? Hi, I'm Tia, this is Ashley, and we did all the design work for the undergraduate symposium this year. Okay, so uh, this is the t-shirts we're wearing. Uh, what can you guys came up with that idea? How did you guys uh, get, think of that uh, design? Well, when we were first trying to figure out a design, we played with a few different things, but 
because it was the 44th year, that was the main thing that we were focusing on. So we decided to go for like a repetition because of the double fours. And then we just slowly built off that. And then our ideas and designs kind of just bloomed from there. Did you guys do the last year's shirts or is this your guys' first year uh, presenting this this year? Uh, this is our first year, oh. yeah. Okay, so good luck. Do you guys have any uh, expectations as for today? Um, I just hope that everybody enjoys the work and I hope that everyone who got a t-shirt loves their t-shirts and it makes us happy to see that everyone's appreciating all the work that we've put in. So just as long as everybody enjoys it and has fun, like that's the main thing that we, that we want. Right. Uh, how long did it take you guys to not only like think of this, but like the whole process of executing it as well? Well, we actually started over the summer. We met a few times to kind of like start getting our ideas going. So honestly, it's been almost a year that we've been working on it. Um, we actually like really started like getting like posters done and stuff in the fall. And then we've just been working on it literally up until like two weeks ago. Good job, guys. It looks really good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So tell me your name and tell me a little bit about your project today. Hi, my name is Brianna Ressler, and um, my project is a 3D poster. Um, it's based on a Spanish uh, streaming event uh, for the game Minecraft. And so I tried to uh, like design the uh, poster to match the, um, the effect of the game, sort of the blocky look of the game. Um, so I just took uh, cardstock and I folded a lot of cubes <laughs> and put it together. Yeah, I can see the kind of imitating that Minecraft uh, effect. Uh, how long did this take for you to put together? A lot. <laughs> yeah, I can't even count how many, how many hours I spent on the cubes. <laughs> how did you balance uh, doing regular classes, but also getting your research ready and getting the materials to build this uh, throughout the whole process? How did you balance it? I mean, it was a class project. Oh. So I was able to use the resources and class time to do it. Um, but pretty much every time, every, like after I got home, I would just sit there and I would fold my cubes and do whatever I was doing. <laughs> what inspired you to make this project? Why did you choose this topic? Um, I like to stream on Twitch. Um, and I also, I love watching Twitch. So this was like one of my favorite events uh, that I've watched in the as, as for as long as I can remember, this is my favorite one. It was it was a lot of fun, and it's how I like discovered my favorite streamer too. Perfect. Thank you so much for interviewing, and good luck today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Frankie. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. So, can you tell us a little bit about your design expo today? Yeah. So I did a design for A Wrinkle in Time, which went up in December at EMU Theater. Um, basically, I'm just showing my Q Lab file, which is what we use to build cues. And then the focus of my project is Foley, so I use traditional instruments or traditional Foley methods as opposed to digital methods that are used nowadays. So for example, I used this little guy right here, his name is Shu, he's a singing saw. I used him to make the sound of wind. And then for rain, I used, it's probably not going to come up when I want it to, but I have a video of me putting a microphone in a bathtub with a trash can over it and turning on the shower and it creates the sound of rain from an inside perspective. So just stuff like that. What has been the craziest kind of, I guess, invention or combination of things that you've used for sound? Um, the shower with the bucket was a pretty big one because I put a microphone in a bathtub. Um, <clears throat> but this has always been my favorite. I use stuff like steel pan drums, um, harmonicas to make certain sounds, but shoe is definitely my favorite because when I pull this out, everyone's like, what is that? So, yeah. Um, is there any way we can hear what it would sound like, kind of? <clears throat> so this is going to come up. Okay, let me... Yep, it's yep. Yep, a whole thing. That is really cool. So is it kind of, what makes you think of these things? Is it just random thoughts that, you know, like how do you have these ideas that like, oh, that might be a really good sound? Um, I just listen <laughs> everywhere I go. Like I work in the shop at EMU Theater and one time I put a router, which is a power tool up to the stage and it made a really cool buzzing sound. And I was like, well, that'll work. And then also I'm a collector of non-conventional instruments, which make very interesting sounds. So. 
So what do you kind of, what's your aim, like your expectation that you want the audience to take away from hearing your different sounds and showing them how you kind of do the process? I want them to notice because a big thing with sound in theater is that you don't notice it unless it's bad. So I aim to make sounds that are, you can hear them and they make you a part of the show as opposed to just watching a show. That's a good point. Thank you so much, Frankie, and good luck today. Thank you. Thank you. Is, can you tell us your name and a little bit about the project you have here today? Yes, yeah, so I'm Iridian Dempsey and um, I created a children's book um, that talks about um, a child's experience with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, so it's kind of centered on this idea of this child has, um, it's called Afid for sure, and um, he goes, he has a sleepover, it's his first sleepover and his big dilemma is, well, I can't eat there and I have to eat there, so how does he navigate that? Um, when I was creating the story, I was kind of thinking about how I want a multi-dimensional character so the disorder isn't the center of the story. And that's kind of like what I went with when I did the project. Yeah, what made you think of that topic and putting it into a kid's book? So what in, like, initially sparked that idea? Yeah, so um, I wanted to do a project with um, so, so I'm a social work student, um, I'm interested in working with kids and um, I want to do a project where there was a sort of under, so, like an under-researched, under-resourced area and AFID is like typically underdiagnosed. there aren't many treatment options out there. I was planning on doing bibliotherapy because I like that, mm -hmm. um, it's something that interests me and I looked and there was like nothing, everything's about picky eating and picky eating isn't AFID so that's why I chose this. Can you kind of explain what AFID is to the people who don't know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, basically, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is um, a disorder that affects both children and adults. It typically involves like an aver aversion to food. It can be for a number of reasons. So it might be that it's like sensory or texture, um, concerns about like food, choking, like stomach upset, or it could be related to trauma. So maybe a child choked on something once. And what happens is they're like, f their food that feels safe to them that they can eat gets like really reduced. So you might have a kid that can only eat like three different things. And even if the packaging changes or like a slight ingredient changes, the kid can't eat that food anymore. Oh. And so you have children who have really limited plates of what they will eat and therefore they can end up with like severe nutritional deficiencies. Um, the unfortunate reality is that AFID can kill kids and adults um, and so it's not it's it's an eating disorder it's not one that many people know about. Yeah I think I didn't know so thank you for teaching me that. Sure. Um, how long have you been working on this book and how long did it take to complete? Uh, I sort of started with the idea in uh, about early 2023 um, was when I sort of was like oh I'm gonna do this and then I finished up this part of it probably around January of this year. And it's uh, creating uh, an illustration. Did you illustrate these actually? Yes. Okay, so is creating and illustrating children's books something you want to do in the future? To a certain degree, I think it will be a side thing. Like I want to do um, therapy with kids oh, okay. um, and this will probably be like a, ah, there's a problem <laughs> here. I want to create something for it. So I'll do it on the side, yeah. Really cool. Thank you so much for your time and good thank luck today. So yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, can you tell me your name and then a little bit about your research project? I'm Samaya Isa. My research project is called uh, Predictors of International Students' Acculturation Processes in the United States. And in, it investigated the acculturation processes of international students when they came here and the different acculturation models they have adopted. What made you want to like spark your initiative to this topic? What made you want to do this? I'm an international student from Egypt, so this this is what got me into it. Yeah. Like I was interested in how like other people um, experience this process too. What kind of what were your results? What did you find? We found that um, participants were experiencing high levels of integration, so they adopted the integration model, which means that they uh, maintained their culture of origin as well as adopted some uh, other like. Uh, cultural strategies uh, from the United States and we had found that um, the least acculturation model adopted was marginalization which was not identifying with either cultures their home culture and the United States culture how long has this entire process been how much like time and effort have you put into it um, I started in January of last year so it has been around a year and a few months wow. yeah 
And throughout this process, what would you say was the like most challenging part? Um, it might be distributing the survey and getting participants to answer. That yeah, I wish I had more participants. I had a total of 66 participants, but I wish we had like a more a larger sample so the results can be more representative. Yeah. Lastly, when people are listening to your oral presentation, what do you hope that your audience will take away? Um, I would like them to like think more about uh, the acculturation process and that it's more complicated than they might think and that discrimination plays a factor uh, in how like international students acculturate. Perfect. Thank you so much and good luck thank today. You. Thank, thank you. you. So Okay, hopefully I am uh, recording. Um, hi everybody, uh, thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Mars Ward and I am a EMU undergraduate student uh, studying TESOL and linguistics. Uh, I'm here to present uh, my research on university student mental health, uh, centering pre-service teachers' perspectives and their experiences with faculty support. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be here in person. I was unfortunately exposed multiple times actually to COVID and I can feel myself getting sick. So I was given the option to uh, pre-record my presentation. Um, so I'm feeling very thankful because I'm honestly very excited about this research. Um, it's pretty personal to me and I am, I'm just so excited to be able to present it. So. I would say, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I hope you find something valuable in this. The first thing I would like to do before I get into any research is to do a wellness activity that I did before in one of my classes. I just want you to, you can stand up, you can sit down, um, take a couple se seconds to stretch your body. Um, think about how it feels in this moment. I know I can't be there personally to hold you accountable and make sure you do that, but I would really appreciate it if you did. Um, next, I would like you to sit down. If you were standing, sit down, plant your feet firmly on the ground, sit up nice and straight in a comfortable and relaxed way for you. Close your eyes and think about how you would rate your mental wellness on a scale of one to 10. One being the worst it's ever been and 10 being the best it could be. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Once you have your number, um, you can open your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to share your number. Um, this is important to me because I want mental wellness and mental health to be at the forefront of our minds. Um, and this is an example of an activity that you can do with students or colleagues to help better support each other and understand where where you're all at and, and how you can best help. So getting into the research, actually before getting into the research, I want to 
um, give a general definition on what mental health is so that we all have a similar understanding. Over the past decade, there's been this unprecedented mental health crisis, and especially during the pandemic, um, this has affected university students in such a consequential consequential way, myself included. Um, I think this is a good starting point just to go over this definition. So mental health as defined by the CDC includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others in our relationships, and make healthy choices. Um, universities across the country have made an effort to provide more professional mental health resources and mental health services, but there are so many students out there who are reporting that they're feeling extremely depressed, feeling extreme anxiety, even reports of suicidal ideation. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of research on just how many students are feeling like that outside of my own research here at EMU. And I found a study done by the American College Health Association that reported that 75% of students that were surveyed experienced moderate to severe psychological distress. Um, that is a pretty alarming number and student counseling services are feeling really ill-equipped to meet this growing need. Um, and with college students juggling a massive amount of coursework, um, new societal challenges uh, and expectations, maintaining community, experiencing loss, um, potential mass violence, varying, varying struggles that are unique to each individual alongside the regular day-to-day -day of just coming into adulthood. Um, there needs to be strong efforts in creating a culture of wellness. Um, and with that, I was thinking, with my mentor, actually, we were both thinking, Dr. Susanna Tomas, we were thinking what kinds of, you know, support is coming from administration? What is faculty doing to help with this unprecedented mental health crisis? Um, and a little bit more research that I did, I found this study by the Boston University of Public Health. They surveyed over a thousand faculty members at 12 universities across 10 different states. And these are some of the statistics from that study. Faculty, 50%, a little over 50% of faculty had a good idea of how to recognize a student in mental distress. And I think that's a great positive starting, starting point. 73% um, welcomed additional professional development. 61% believe there should be mandatory basic training. Um, again, a really good starting point. 28.8% um, of those that were surveyed have participated in a training program with over 70% of them finding it helpful or very helpful. Um, so there's already this great start in administrative support. People are clearly thinking about what they can do um, systemically, you know, curriculum wise to help their students with this, with, with mental health. Um, the research that I did was specifically with TESOL pre-service teachers um, and their mental health and what kind of faculty support they, that has been provided here at Eastern. There's been this, you know, great initiative by administration to boost mental health awareness uh, within faculty curriculum. They've been searching for ways to support students, like utilizing check-ins, doing the wellness activity we did earlier. And I have a bunch of suggestions at the end of my presentation of the different kinds of initiatives that EMU has been implementing. Um, but the research I did, I had 37 people participate in my survey, which is a a great turnout. I'm hoping for more, but it's a good turnout so far. I did an IRB approved anonymous voluntary survey that consisted of these following questions, asking about their experience in professors taking an active interest in their mental health, recalling these experiences, if they were positive or negative, um, student recommendations outside of recommending professional services, and an optional question or a space to allow students to share their thoughts and experiences. Um, out of 37 EMU pre-service 
teacher responses, 75.7% of them had a professor take an active interest in their mental well-being. What a amazing statistic. That's really honestly wonderful that um, so many of them have had a professor care for them in that way. 21.6% of responses uh, did not have any experiences. And there was one response that elaborated that, yes, they had a professor take an active interest. I guess you can't say active because they said it felt superficial, which I'll elaborate a little bit more on later. So the positive experiences versus the negative experiences, again, there was an overwhelming amount of positive experiences that these students have had, which is um, a testament to these initiatives that EMU has been putting forth. 25 pre-service teachers indicated their experience was positive. These were just a handful of the quotes um, of these responses, but generally they had professors asking how they were doing, doing these daily check-ins, allowing flexibility in their assignment deadlines, asking for more time because of these mental health problems that they're facing, emphasizing taking care of themselves within the curriculum, um, on how to succeed in class and in daily life, and just allowing flexibility when they're stressed. Um, and these are some amazing responses, and I'm very, very happy that that there's definitely more positive than negative experiences. Um, but I do want to highlight some of the negative responses that students have had because these are also reflective of reflective of some of the experiences that I've had at Eastern, where I have had professors disregard my mental health. Um, or just generally not understand what's going on. Um, some of these students said that professors were saying they were making excuses, telling them they need to get over it because everyone gets over it. Teachers that don't promote rest. And then this last quote was the one about um, it feeling superficial. They said the only professor who even mentioned our mental health seemed very superficial when doing it. But uh, like asking to fill out a one to two question form, but never followed up on it, even if you mentioned not doing well. I've had a few professors say, make sure to go outside this weekend, but never gave us the break and assignments to do so. Um, so students will know when this is just a superficial thing that a prep behind it. Um, and that does make an impact on their mental health and their experience. Uh, the suggestions that students had mostly revolved around their course load, um, their lack of resources or office hours, lack of adequate time to complete assignments, or these really rigid and flexible deadlines. And then the other side of it was this lack of knowledge or understanding <clears throat> or empathy for all kinds of students. Um, if Eastern wants to have this wonderful, unique, diverse student body, they're going to come with diverse challenges. And even if a professor can't relate to certain kinds of experiences, having the knowledge and understanding and empathy for it is something that makes a world of difference for students. These are two of a couple of the quotes that were mostly about heavy workload and deadlines. Um, you can read these while I speak to my own experience. Um, I am a student who dropped out at least three or four times because of mental health issues. I also worked full time the entire time I've pursued my undergraduate degree. I've been trying for this degree since 2011, so it's it's been a very long time. The last time that I dropped out was right before the pandemic. Um, because I just hit a breaking point where I couldn't take it anymore. And um, I had, just like the second quote, I had concerns about my ability to handle the workload and and the strain and, and all of it. I was also going through a CPTSD diagnosis. I came out as transgender and non-binary, you know, during my undergraduate degree experience, um, Having to go through all of these things while also being under the pressure of having to perform as a student was incredibly stressful, um, and it definitely made a huge impact on, on my mental health. Um, and then these are some of the other quotes that students had. There we go. Um, more around the 
understanding and empathy of mental health. Um, being more understanding takes a lot of the stress away, um, including a list of recommendations for self-care and resources in the syllabus, um, explaining what mental health is and what they could do as a class to maintain it. These are just some of the suggestions that students had uh, in regards to understanding mental health. I was also able to do, I wanted to do more, um, but unfortunately with the IRB process, it was very slow to get everything approved. I was only able to do one qualitative interview so far in my research, um, but this interview that I did um, with this recent EMU graduate gave, they gave such tremendously empathetic and compassionate recommendations for professors. Um, that I'll let you read here. We both have a similar experience of having mental health conditions that existed before coming to university and then having those exacerbated by being in school. We are also both non-binary and think it's incredibly important to include content that's relevant to your students' diverse identities and being culturally sensitive and understanding of of these different kinds of people that are going to be in your classes and including that in your content is really important that represents that representation means everything um one thing that they spoke to was do not let students debate the existence or the moral ethics of being a minority and in in our case it was about our gender and sexuality being a part of the lgbt community but um allowing students to spew hatred and bigotry in your class is going to make sure that your students drop out. Um, that was something that we both experienced at our time here, and uh, it's really important to not let that happen. Um, giving opportunities for identity exploration and using intersectionality to show that how students view your content depends on the identities they carry. Um, doing community building activities helps all of us feel less alone, helps maintain good mental health because as humans, we need people, we need other people, we need community, we need diversity. Um, and one of the community building activities that they mentioned was if you're having a discussion, a really simple difference to make is just do it in a circle. We're all facing each other. We're all equals versus the power dynamics of having all students in one row facing, you know, one person in power, you know, you can break that down and help students feel like they have more community by just doing it in a circle. Um, and then coming from a strengths-based perspective instead of a deficit-based perspective, I've had so many teachers, not even just in in university but throughout life elementary middle high school where they're coming from a place of you can't do this or you won't do this or coming from this deficit based perspective where the there's something that's lacking in the student versus a strengths based perspective of you have a unique wonderful identity and a unique wonderful story that you can bring to the classroom and then use that to help educate further. It's it's just so much more compassionate to come from strength versus deficit. These were some of the strategies that have already been being <clears throat> implemented uh, in classes like the uh, early semester needs or assets analysis to learn about your students. Um, Dr. Susanna Tomas, who is my mentor for all of this, uh, and also my professor, she would often do these simple check-ins and just like the one I did today, give me a one to 10 on your well-being today. Um, short or extended class debriefs on personal goal setting, because why are we here in the first place if not for setting personal goals for ourselves, for our careers and our futures? Um, doing the campus treasure hunt uh, we did that last semester in my class, and honestly, that made me feel so much more connected to my colleagues, and it was honestly just, like, really fun. Um, 
And then just so simply just reaching out and keeping the line of communication open. If you see that a student is struggling or if you just sense it, just sending them an email saying, hey, I'm here for you. Some students aren't at that point of crisis where they need professional services. They just need that extra oomph of support, you know, from, from their professor. And I know I wouldn't have come back to school if I didn't think that my professors believed in me. Um, simple as that. So with that, uh, I hope these are some final takeaways that you can have from this research. It's it's a really wonderful initiative that Eastern is doing. Um, and especially for like pre-service teachers, we've been shown to be particularly susceptible to well-being threats. We have alarming levels of stress, burnout, and dropout rates. Um, and we also work with a lot of populations who experience severe trauma. Um, and we need to feel prepared for that. When teacher educators in university settings integrate this well-being and this education on mental health into their curriculum, they're, they're not only helping their students who are pre-service teachers, it's creating this domino effect of they get to help their students and then those students get to help more people. And we always want to model what we want them to do and how they want to feel, if that makes sense. It's it's just a positive domino effect. It's only good can come from it. Um, and then with this research specifically, I think EMU's recent initiatives to implement mental wellness education is making a huge difference. You see it in this research, you see the overwhelmingly positive response to it um, with these students really feeling very thankful for just these small things like check-ins and maintaining that in curriculum. Um, and then maintaining compassion, compassion for all students it makes a huge difference in their academic success. It helps the university retention and graduation rates. Students who feel supported are less likely to drop out and more likely to succeed for their goals in the future. And I would hope that that's all anybody wants. Um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to email me, um, oward at emish.edu. I am more than happy to answer any questions about my research. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.
out his appearance on a podcast in February that was deemed so offensive it was removed from Spotify and Apple Music. Sawayama did not state his name, but the specific controversy she stated, it was clear who she was talking about. And although it is a small stake in her masters, it is still a number of royalties going to someone she does not ethically agree with. This also has an interesting connection to Swift, as only a month prior, Healy had been in a relationship with Taylor Swift, and she had drawn criticism for being around someone such as Healy. Essentially, Swift had dated Sawayama's broad. However, despite all these problems, not all artists actually want to own their masters. Some of them actually sell them for a very large payday. This is usually done by aging and retired artists. However, in 2023, there were two notable cases of younger artists who were not retired who sold their masters for a large sum of money. These being Justin Bieber, who sold his for $200 million in the age of 28. Only a couple of months later, this was followed by Katy Perry selling hers for $225 million and 38 years old. Although this can lead to a lot of music, if you do not have ownership of your masters, you do not make royalties off of this music. And as such, if you choose to release more, you will likely make more money in the long run by owning masters. Now, in conclusion, music copyright is something that is needed to protect artists. However, the way that it exists in the United States, there are a lot of problems, and it can lead to needless lawsuits, needless accusations, and even artists having to recreate their discographies from the ground up. And as such, we need some reform and new discussion on how copyright can work. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, uh, you first. They are really they are really similar. I think there was potential for a case there. Um, if they were a larger band that she could have heard it, I think that there was grounds for copyright infringement. And the case, so the case basically, the judge said that they could reform their decision, they could bring more evidence, but the band ultimately did choose to drop it. Uh, I think it is unlikely that she actually had ever heard Live Your Life, considering the band is extremely niche. So it is dicey, but I don't think that there was an actual case there with the evidence. And it should be noted that there have been other lawsuits over levitating, but I have not done a ton of research into those. So it seems to be a song that is somewhat derivative. Yes? I think it's because, so the re-recordings have been successful, but it does seem that the original albums are more successful. The reason this is likely is, although she promotes the re-recordings like a full album, she does not do everything. She'll do like one or two music videos, and she'll promote them for maybe like a month before moving on to something else. Another reason is because the re-recordings are music people have already heard. And as such, people are perhaps less excited for it, um, and the ball tracks are not as heavily promoted, whereas when it comes to new music, that's new music. You haven't heard it before. And another reason is because, of course, people love the celebrity drama around it all. People want to hear what she has to say about her recent breakup uh, with her next album. And as such, it makes sense that her new ones tend to do better. Uh, it is somewhat marginal in comparison because either way, they are always massive successes. Thank you. Yes. So my main suggestion would be by default to let artists own their masters, um, although there are situations where they don't want to. I think that there should be more of a choice. A lot of artists are kind of backed into a corner because they have to sell their masters in order to get the resources that a label will give them. I think that by default artists should own their masters or own a higher stake in their masters at least. And I think that they should not tighten the contracts to be 10 to 30 years. They should keep it at about two years. That's a pretty 
reasonable time because there also might be reasons you want to artistically re-record music. Maybe you want to get the production different or want to do a remix. So I believe masters should do that. I think there should also be better definition of what actually counts as copyright infringement because as said with Olivia Rodrigo, the songs are kind of unclear. She did state that the song Deja Vu was inspired by Swifts, but it is the way she sings on the bridge specifically and Swift didn't invent that form of singing. So it gets very subjective artistically and I think we need to be more clear on what things are owned artistically and what things are up for grabs.
was, uh, despite the fact that fraternities are male-dominated spaces, the brothers in this fraternity are able to express themselves through language in the ways they show themselves off to the world in non-traditional ways in traditional real life setting. Um, during this research, I noticed that gender and identity are informed by existing structures of gender, but those structures are also made and transformed by the way we talk about them. Um, one of the um, things that I saw in um, normal fraternities, or not normal fraternities, but um, fraternities um, that are not co-ed are hegemonic masculinity. Hegemonic masculinity is an ideology that orders identities um, into subordinate and dominant uh, categories. Um, so in fraternities, um, normally someone who has more experience over other um, brothers will have more power, which is something that worked in the fraternity that I worked with, but I believe that it was more uh, based on a hierarchy instead of this hegemonic masculinity. Um, um, and so they still had masculinity in the fraternity. For example, they refer to it as a frat, and also they refer to all the members as brothers instead of using maybe siblings or brothers and sisters. Um, this fraternity also took part in Greek life, uh, meaning they hosted parties and also had a hierarchy. Um, a lot of these parties were hosted and a lot of these parties that were hosted were reappropriated to create areas where people could express themselves through non-traditional gendered ways. Uh, during the Halloween party that I went to at this frat, um, they could dress however they wanted. For example, um, people dressed anywhere from a minimal star field, um, which would be uh, which included having orange ears, orange cocktail, and a white shirt that said "I hate Mondays." On it. Um, anywhere to an elaborate um, uh, Abraham Lincoln and James Wilkes Booth uh, costume. Um, there was also a um, brother who I saw there named Tammy, and um, she was dressed up as King Charles um, and holding a photo of the Queen. Um, the, uh, and the whole entire time she was talking in a very broken English accent and talking about how sad she was that the Queen had passed. Um, also, there were two other people who were there who um, had um, facial hair but was also wearing maid's dresses. Um, this fraternity also had three brothers of, um, who were in a band, and those three brothers consisted of a trans man, a non-binary person, and a person who didn't have a set gender or identity. Um, this band played during house concerts, as well as um, local bars, in, uh, as well as playing at local bars. Um, and while they played at local bars, the um, frat would post <coughs> on social media telling people to go and see them live. Um, and I believe that this shows that the frat allows this kind of gender expression in um, events that they hosted, but also that um, they were proud whenever they were able to perform at different um, locations. Along with gender being shown in non-traditional ways at parties, people seem more than happy to, ex uh, to share their gender experience with other people. So for example, I was at a rush event. A rush event is where um, a um, <coughs> people who want to be members at this fraternity will go and talk to the frat members and um, try to get them to let them join. Um, and so I was at this rush event and um, a brother named Tyler was talking to a group of people who we hadn't met yet um, and uh, he was telling them how not only was um, or he was considering himself to be a cis man, but they were also going by he, him, and they, them pronouns. <coughs> um, and I believe that this showed that brothers um, can, um, are open about the way that they identify, even if it is with people who are looking to joining the frat, um, because they know that these people expect this from this fraternity. Um, the brothers also created in-group terminology. Um, one of the words I heard used a lot was frat, which basically meant that they liked something. So, um, like, let's say they were watching a movie, and at the end of the movie, someone would say frat to express that they liked the movie that was being shown. Um, another terminology that I heard used was T-boy swag, uh, which I heard this terminology used by a brother named Bill. Uh, so me, Bill, and another brother named Friend were um, watching a documentary, and in the documentary, it was a man who grew up in the 90s, and he had long black hair and was wearing a leather jacket. And so he um, said that 
that that man had a team of swag, which to him meant that he wished that he could look like that person, <coughs> but also that he thought that that man in the documentary looked like a stereotypical trans man. Um, and uh, then he and Fred proceeded to talk about how every trans man needs to own a leather jacket, either brought to, given to him by um, their uncle or uh, grandfather. Um, and in an article I read about traditional uh, fraternities, Scott Kiesling discusses a similar phenomenon um, as the brothers use language to reaffirm hegemonic masculinity. Kiesling talks about a time where um, Pete, Dave, and Boss um, are playing Monopoly together, and Pete lands on a property that Dave owns, um, and so Pete then responds with, and doesn't have to pay, so then Pete responds with, hi honey, I'm home. Uh, Kiesling goes on to explain that this was done because of that fraternity's understanding of gender and culture, um, and so the, <coughs> culture, uh, the gender stereotype that they were working on um, was fictional roles of a stereotypical American husband greeting his housewife upon returning home from work. Um, I believe that um, these, uh, this relates to the concept of T-boy swag because in both concept, or in both situations, they are working on stereotypes that they both understand. Um, in the study, I saw that members of this fraternity were able to use the traditional settings of Greek life to reaffirm their identities through things like an outfit choice at a party or in their terminology. Um, I believe that this is helpful for people to be more comfortable with who they um, who they are and give them room to try new things like using uh, new pronouns as well as wearing something that someone normally wouldn't wear outside of this context. So that's it. Thank you. Um, I am not allowed to discuss that. Sorry. Did you find that that frat kind of like still behaved in a way from the traditional frat? So did they have a similar like teasing kind of really <coughs> bad things or do you think it kind of subverted that? Um, so I don't believe that they participated in hazing. Um, I think that um, uh, the way that they um, hosted the um, rush events, um, I believe that it felt more accepting. Um, I'm not very, I'm not very familiar with um, like traditional fraternities um, like processes. I've only heard stories about what the hazing looks like and stuff like that. So um, yeah. So you said that there were, so you said there are transgender people in this fraternity, but there are also people who were not. Do you think from your experience with them that they, that group, those groups are still pretty split within the fraternity, or do you think that they were all, um, like, do you think that those trans individuals were mostly close to the other trans individuals, and the people who weren't were still mostly close to those people, and that there was a split, or do you think that, that they still were very close to the group, despite yeah. that difference? Um, so my main point of contact was um, through a brother named Bill, and he was a trans man. And so a lot of the times with him, I would then talk to the men and trans men of the group. I wouldn't really talk a lot to the women. Um, I do believe that he was friends with a lot of the women, but whenever I was there, um, I wouldn't be talking to any of them. So I assume that to some extent, yes, there's a little bit of separation between the groups, but I believe that they all talk to each other as if they are a part of a, a group. Um, but yeah. How much time did you get to spend with uh, brothers? Yeah, um, so I um, went to a few concerts throughout um, going there. I think I went to maybe five. And then I had um, a few events where they had parties. And then on um, one occasion, I believe, I went to the third party with um, Bill and me and him just hung out. So how would you compare the sort of opportunities for this sort of gender affirming behavior interactions within the space of the fraternity versus an alternative space, right? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm trying to get at the, yeah, yeah. the the weight of that label of fraternity and the yeah. history and the structure. Um, I remember I, I, I remember I talked to one of the brothers and um, he brought that up where um, he, he didn't like the, 
the idea of going to a co-ed. He felt that the fraternity felt different than going to an actual place that was referred to as a co-ed. Um, so he liked the idea of being able to go to a place called a fraternity but not participate in the actions of an actual fraternity. Uh, he was also a trans man, so I believe that maybe it had something to do with he felt more comfortable being around um, people who uh, either were accepting towards him or had more um, understanding of transness. Um, so I believe that, um, yeah, I believe that the reason why this would be better for um, someone rather than co-ed is because if you want to have the fraternity experience but without having to deal with those um, gender norms um, of a uh, fraternity that's dominated by mainly masculine people. All right, thank you. Perspectives from Campus Safety Student Employees. Um, so hello, my name is Jordan Gerwig. Um, I am currently an employee involved in Campus Safety, so this was a topic that meant a lot to me. Um, it is an expansion off of a project I did previously in my Sociology of Work class with Dr. Dr. Trisha McTagg. Um, so overview of what the study is, or what, the study, or what this presentation will be covering, um, a description of what the study is, the methods used, the opinions of um, other campus safety employees, any stressful situations they may have encountered, their own feelings of safety, and then a conclusion where they were allowed to share any opinions that they thought were necessary for me to know that were not um, asked about in the study. So what was the study? The study asked how student public employees, workers, safety workers, feel about their work and how these workers negotiate and manage the feelings and emotions during work. These included emotional reactions to the workplace situations and how that shaped their work, their job satisfaction, and work identities. And these emotions ranged from intense to mundane situations that included things like fear, pride, joy, and boredom, some of which are shown in statements made by some of the participants in the study. And the study specifically looked to answer if working in public safety influences the way you perceive safety outside of your work environment, and has this perception changed since working in public safety or not. So for this study, participants were either currently working in or previously worked in campus safety. And for this study, a variety of questions pertaining to feelings towards campus safety and their work environments were asked. Some questions, examples include if there was a specific shift that impacts the perspective of safety, um, what they liked least and most about their job or if anything had surprised them, if they think it's an emotional job, if they have ever experienced a stressful situation at work, what it was and how they coped with it and how they felt, um, how safe they feel after having worked in campus safety, if that stressful experience has impacted the safety, safety that they feel, and then if this perspective was different prior to working there. Also, how they personally would describe the safety environment on campus, 
And then again, if there was anything else they wanted to share. So for their shift in job opinions, when asked if one shift impacted their perception of safety more than another, pretty much all participants said yes, specifically noting that the shifts that check emergency alert systems around campus were the ones that did that. What they liked most were usually that it's an on-campus job and the purpose of the organization in general. What they liked least usually included the hours, but also mentioned of funding and equipment issues. And then if anything was surprising, it was usually the amount of program, amount the program does, and also the lack of working emergency systems. So for the study, the big focus was emotional labor. And participants were not given a definition of what an emotional job is, so that way we could see their responses to this. It is typically defined as a process in which workers manage their emotions and to influence the emotional state of others. However, for the purpose of the study, it was instead referring to the emotions one can feel when their job gets stressful. So is this an emotional job? <coughs> Most participants said yes, but. And it was a very common theme of like, yes, but I've had the situation, or yes, but something that impacted their decision in that. Um, nothing that some of the shift, noting that some of the shifts are more emotional because of the type of calls, with one employee saying, but there are shifts every now and then where something intense will occur on campus or we're able to help someone who really needed us in that moment. Those are the shifts that cause emotion to arise and remind me that those involved, why the program is such an important resource on campus. So what are some stressful situations these employees have faced? All participants said they have faced at least one stressful situation at work. And what it was, a couple of participants mentioned shots fired off of campus or an active threat of a, or a threat of an active shooter previously in the day. Um, during these situations, feelings tended to be panic, frustrated or worried or distressed. And how they coped was usually by remaining calm and providing support to those who needed it. One employee said, telling myself that because of my calm and ability to help those who needed it, I was able to provide the necessary support. So feelings of safety. The perceived safety of campus from employee perspectives, there was a theme of feeling unsafe, specifically noting a less of a program presence overall compared to past years. Also, um, the impact of stressful experiences, all participants said yes and had statements about feeling safer doing, due to knowing how to handle those situations. Um, so differing perspectives prior to employment, one participant would say that they thought it was less safe beforehand, but another thought it was safer. And then describing the safety environment on campus, one employee called it a mediocre facade. If the systems put in place actually worked, my opinion would be vastly changed. So two employees, two statements I chose to include um, for what other information you want me to know. One employee said there are a few jobs on campus where your primary job is to serve your community and get paid for it. Working for this program is the best opportunity to feel as though you are doing something positive for your community every time you clock in. But on a different note, another employee said the defunding of the program, especially in this last year, is so extreme, I would bet by next year that the program would no longer exist. Um, and then if you have or ever feel unsafe on campus, um, here are some contact information for this campus specifically for any resources immediately within the police department that you could reach out to. Thank you. Yeah, so on this campus specifically, that would be like the AEDs and the boxes that you see around in buildings um, or occasionally outside. Uh, I can't see any in here, um, but there's like very bright blue lights around outside um, or small blue boxes on walls that are typically supposed to be a direct connection to the police department. Um, campus safety employees were saying that like these are no systems that work 
um, because part of their job is to check these systems and that being an impact, impact on their feelings of safety that they have on campus because they know that, hey, maybe this system doesn't work. So if I have a situation here, my help won't be heard. Um, so for my job, there wasn't much. I was trained by other campus safety employees. Um, so that was kind of it. I mean, we do get like, um, well, for my job, we had uh, some like basic training of like mandated, mandated reporter, um, Cleary Act stuff. So, I mean, not much from the police department specifically. It's usually just like previous employees. Do you think that campus would feel safer if the um, people in charge of the emergency alert systems were required to report the information that the student campus safety workers collect? I think so, yeah. Um, because I think it would, there's a false sense of security, or there can be a false sense of security, um, especially if you're going out somewhere and you're like, oh, I'll be fine because there's these blue light systems all over the place but then they don't work and now you're in a situation and you don't know what to do. I was gonna ask you, um, I think part of the reason that, I don't know if this was part of the screen, but like the, the program was seeking funding and the other like, the program's like, oh, we're trying to equip students with pepper spray or like self-defense. Like is that like kind of trying to counteract or? Um, I don't entirely know um, because usually, um, all of my participants were students, and they're not always privy to that information, because that's more of like what the adults handle than the students who just show up to work. Thank you, Devin. So, um, two parts of this question could be funny. So, I guess my question would be with this um, information that you have gotten from your fellow students, what would you like to see the campus do with it? Um, just all campuses overall, making sure that the funding is in place for safety systems. Um, like one participant said, calling it a mediocre facade, having that, it shouldn't be a facade, it should be a reality that this campus is safe. And if you're advertising a safe campus, then it should be a safe campus, not a advertising way to get people to come to the campus. Did any of the participants in your um, questionnaires give any indications about some of the things that they see as the sources of safety on campus in addition to the blue boxes? No. Um, there is like a police presence on campus, so there are like police officers that will roam, um, but they're not always like right there is the thing. And the purpose of the blue box systems is usually to have a voice right there um, because I know on this campus the blue box systems when you push the call button it goes directly to the police department so there's no in between of like having to wait for an officer to arrive and there's usually cameras on those systems too so they can see what's going on.
Over to our first speaker, Parker Gregg, faculty mentor, Professor Higby. Hello, I will be very brief. That means 75 minutes. I've planned this room in an hour and a half class. So my hour and a half lecture is much short. I'm pleased to introduce my student from History 115, Introduction to Native American. He wrote the best paper in the class. And I said, Have you heard of symposium? Turns out he has. In fact, he's on the, this panel session twice. And so I'm responsible for his kickoff performance. Yeah. Somebody else. Thank you, Dr. Higby. Uh, I'm Parker Gregg. I'm a political science student here at EMU. I, can you hear me all right if I don't use this? Is it that big of a deal? Okay. Yeah, I'm Parker Gregg. I'm a political science student here at EMU. And I would like to start off by acknowledging that right now we are on what, prior to the founding of Ypsilanti, Michigan, is historically Ottawa, Ojibwe, Wyandotte, and Potawatomi land. Um, uh, so, tragedy is a drama that is posed in such a way as to elicit twin feelings of pity and fear. These feelings lead to a catharsis, a sort of emotional unburdening. Now, for a long time in American society and culture, we have had a tendency to perceive indigenous history as a long series of horrible tragedies where indigenous people lack agency to create better futures and better lives for themselves. They are seen as mere automatons uh, faced with a centuries-long onslaught of colonialism at the hands of the U.S. government. Now, these perceptions are incorrect, obviously, and they ignore a rich indigenous history that is full of life, love, resistance, survival, and adaptation. Today, I'm going to be telling you about two books that push back on these notions of indigenous history. Uh, the first is The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. It is a Pulitzer Prize winning novel that is set on the Turtle Mountain Reservation in northern North Dakota and follows the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa throughout the 1950s as they combat House Resolution 108. House Resolution 108 was a part of the termination period of indigenous history in which the US federal government sought to terminate the federally recognized status of multiple tribes across the US. And the book is also loosely based on Erdrich's own grandfather, who was one of the leaders in the fight to cease termination of his tribe. The second book I'll be talking about is The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. It is the first one-volume survey of North American indigenous history written by David Troyer, uh, an Ojibwe man from Leech Lake Reservation uh, in Leech Lake, Minnesota. Um, the Heartbeat of Wounded Knee covers indigenous history from 10,000 BCE to about 2019. And in doing so, it breaks indigenous history down into seven different distinct periods that reflect how indigenous peoples related to one another, as well as the, the US government once the uh, colonial process began. So when we view indigenous stories as being a series of tragedies, we also place indigenous people and the stories that are still unraveling today squarely in our past. Um, and these books do a lot to combat that idea. Um, one place that they, that they grapple with this specifically is the way that they deal with fighting. In The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, MMA makes up a pretty decent part of the book, and boxing 
is a very important part of Erdrich's novel. So the ways that they speak about organized consensual fighting reflects the way that each book grapples with violence that is done to indigenous communities and how that violence shapes these communities. Um, in The Night Watchman, there are two boxing matches between Wood Mountain, who is a young Chippewa man, a grandson of a man who fought in the Battle of Little Bighorn and attempted to flee to Canada with Sitting Bull. He has a long history of resistance in his family, and even though he's a fictional character, it uh, comes across as very impactful that he is continuing this, this history of fighting, this history of resistance on throughout the entire book. Now, what makes the boxing scenes important in Erdrich's novel is that they are the most direct scenes of violence in the entire book, despite the fact that we understand from start to finish that this book is full of people grappling <laughs> with institutional violence, right? Eric narrates these boxing matches as if she were a commentator, though throughout the rest of the novel, violence tends to lurk in the shadows and it constantly looms over its characters. It takes the form of spirits and memories, short glimpses into what somebody in the book is dealing with rather than being confronted head on. And this reflects the fact that the book is set in the 1950s during the period of termination, where there was a constant looming threat that they would lose their tribal identity. Not only lose it, but have it directly taken away from them. And uh, Thomas Wajash, who is the character that Erdrich's grandfather is uh, based on, he is one of the key characters in this book, and he talks about how the forces they were up against were implacable and distant. And, and in their distance, they could reach out and swipe away an entire people. And I think that this is reflective of, of the way that, that Erdrich tends to deal with violence in this novel. The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, on the other hand, is it's a historical book that is peppered with journalistic interviews and autobiographical information. And Troyer deals with violence in a much more direct way um, because it's full of the colonial history that indigenous peoples have had to deal with. Um, and the MMA fights center on Troyer's cousin, a man named Sam. Now Sam was in the US Army. He lost his mother and his sister to suicide. Uh, he spent time in prison for assault. He spent years dealing drugs, and he is uh, almost a quintessential example of what, of, of the barriers put in front of indigenous people to this very day. He is not a fictional character. He's a man who is still existing right now. And he reflects the fact that indigenous people face higher incarceration rates. They face uh, more economic barriers to success. They face a worse off education system. Um, and I think that that all of this is uh, incredibly uh, important because this, this fighting, this constant fighting that is, that is put in these novels reflects a small part of this larger fight for freedom for indigenous people and reflects a constant need to resist colonial forces through a diversity of tactics in order to maintain their homelands, maintain their identities, and to keep one another safe. Uh, and it's one thing to, to sit up here and talk about how great these books are, how much they, they challenge these narratives of indigenous history as a tragedy. It's another thing to sit up here and do a land acknowledgement before I give my speech. But what is truly important is that, that we take these new perspectives and that we actually do something to support indigenous people in maintaining their cultures that have been attacked for so long. Uh, if you're going to read The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, then I recommend that you read Troyer's essays on uh, giving the, uh, on, on giving US national parks back to indigenous tribes to be maintained. Uh, I recommend that you read about the land back movement uh, because changing the perspective on indigenous history is entirely hollow if we don't do something 
to make sure that indigenous peoples can continue to exist and to thrive in communities that have that have thrived through a incredible amount of diversity um, for the last 400 years. Yeah, so, I don't I still don't need it. Um, so this is just the topic of the 10-minute the discussion, right? The Night Watchman specifically is far more about the female experience, and it specifically deals with issues that are still occurring today, like missing and murdered indigenous women. In fact, the main character of this book is a young woman named Patrice, and a huge theme throughout the book is that Patrice's sister Vera goes missing, and... Uh, Around the middle of the book, a significant portion is dedicated to trying to figure out what happened to Vera. It is Patrice and her mother, Jeanne, and other women in their community coming together to protect one another uh, from interpersonal violence, sexual violence, domestic abuse, institutional violence, all of these forces that are set against them. And I think that like the solidarity that these women have with each other and the ways that their characters are written to to be incredibly loving and caring for one another's safety is like one of the most beautiful things that, that this book does. So, given that you've read both books and you've written on both and you've given a great presentation, what would you like for us to take away from your conversation about the book and also about what you learned through this process? Yeah, um, I think that the most important thing to take away is that like, American society still has some grappling to do with its own history in terms of, uh, of what, what our government, what we have done to indigenous people. And um, a part of that is, is like rewriting these histories in a way that better reflects the fact that, uh, that indigenous history is one of constant resistance through a huge diversity of tactics. And I think that that was one of the most important things that I took away from the heartbeat of Wounded Knee specifically, is it's not like Troyer throughout the whole thing is just like uh, egging on the most radical forms of like resisting colonialism, right? A part of giving people agency is respecting their ability to make decisions for themselves regardless of what those decisions are and whether or not you agree with them. So I, I think that, that would be the big takeaway. Does that, does that answer the question? Thank you. So you mentioned a diversity of tactics. Um, any ideas of what these tactics are and you want to do with them? Yeah. Um, well, one thing that Troyer writes about in quite a bit of detail throughout the book is that, to be quite frank, certain tribes who were very skilled at engaging in strategic violence against the United States uh, tended to have uh, tend, tend to have uh, larger reservations and more land in the present day. Uh, if you look at the Dakota, Dakota, for example. Uh, but that's not just violence for violence' sake. It's also being skilled in diplomacy, uh, figuring out creative ways in the modern day to develop. Um, uh, economic systems on the reservation. Uh, in The Night Watchman, there's a character named Louis Pipestone who is, he's fascinating, he's a really interesting guy. And the majority of the time that his character gets is trying to get literally everyone that he has ever met and can, can possibly find to sign a petition that would halt the termination of the tribe, right? And these are all completely valid strategies in trying to to maintain your culture and maintain your people. Uh, they wind up sending a delegation to DC uh, to speak to elected representatives on the termination of their tribe too, and that is another example of this diversity of tactics. I have one more. Uh,
Absolutely. Um, that was, that actually goes back to a different paper I wrote for Dr. Higby that was about how, uh, what the white South called the five civilized tribes uh, participated in chattel slavery. And uh, a lot of these tribes were forcibly removed on the Trail of Tears, but the ones who remained um, were basically told, you can either maintain your economic wealth and reject your tribal identity in order to continue to participate in chattel slavery and keep all your money, uh, or you can like take your possessions out west. And there were a lot of people who, who chose the first option, right? Uh, and I think that there is like a constant history of turning tribes against one another uh, and convincing one tribe that they're superior to uh, other races of people or other tribes or anything like that. And like that this ultimate goal is to become white in some instances. Like that is the bar that is set, if that makes sense. So she proposed this topic, and over time she's been looking at different facets of that. One of the things we do in political science is talk about some of the controversial topics that make people a little uncomfortable, but we have to have good students and scholars who can take that on, and today's era is one of those people. So I want to talk about her research on critical race. I believe that's a space for her, but one thing I will say, because we're very proud, she is graduating with in April. <laughs> in April, and she's been accepted to the University of Michigan's public policy program. Look at her life cycle. But we're proud of her as a department, and we expect great things. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. So, hi, as I was introduced, my name is Tierra Trezant. I'm majoring in public and nonprofit administration and minoring in Africology and African American studies. So, I would like the microphone. <laughs> so for today's topic, we'll be talking about critical race theory in education, specifically what teachers have to say about these public policies. So why should you listen to what I have to say? This issue impacts you. Politicians are coming after our rights as diverse students to be seen and heard and represented in educational spaces. Additionally, they are removing funding and programming for programs for diverse students. Even if you yourself do not identify as a diverse student from a marginalized community, it does impact your ability to have people with different perspectives in your classrooms. An example I provided to you today is the University of Wisconsin system, which has removed and defunded DEI programming due to the pressures of state lawmakers. First, I want to say that we should not be using the words critical race theory to talk about this issue. But since that's the most popular and coined term for this, I will be using this just for simplicity. I wanted to start by saying that critical race theory is not taught in schools. Critical race theory originated as a legal theory that was taught to students in law schools. Essentially, it said that colorblind policies were not actually helping people from black communities despite their intentions and the researchers and scholars wanted to know why. The concept transitioned to educational research in the 1990s, and in that, researchers were looking at how educational systems, such as disciplinary actions and funding, impacted students. So what do people mean now when they mention CRT? When someone refers to being against CRT, they are referring to being against anything that is diversity, equity, and recruitment related. Social justice and essentially anything they don't like coming from the voices of marginalized communities. So why is critical race theory such a big deal? In the words of people who oppose critical race theory, specifically Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, we won't allow Florida tax dollars to be spent teaching kids 
to hate our country or to hate each other. I chose this quote from Ron DeSantis because he is a governor of a state that has one of the most restrictive anti-CRT laws. Do people even want CRT banned? I would say that they do not. 70% of people have no idea what CRT is. 44% of people feel neutral about CRT being taught in schools. 33% are opposed to having it taught. So, who has passed these bills? I'd say definitely a lot of people are trying to stop the discussion of this topic, and that is because there have been 565 attempts across state lawmakers or school districts or individual schools themselves to stop these conversations. So despite people not knowing a lot about CRT and they're passing these laws anyway, despite it not being very popular, what do these laws say? Blatant racism. If they blame certain topics, such as saying one race is better than another race, that we should be biased against someone of a different race because of their race. There's also, they ban critiques of founding documents, such as the Declaration of Independence, and saying things like slavery isn't a divergence from the ideas, instead of the true ideas that the country was founded on. It also prohibits requiring teachers to discuss current events. And when they do discuss current events, they must maintain a neutral position. They also prohibit discussions of biases and privileges. So you can't say someone is privileged because of their race or gender, and you can't say that all people are inherently biased or have some, how do I say this? Or like are biased against people inherently or unconsciously. So what are our teachers in this conversation? I believe that we must center their voices because they are the ones responsible for carrying out these policies. They have direct contact with the students, and therefore, this will change the day-to-day -day lives of their instructional career. 14% of teachers have experienced harassment due to how they have or have not addressed race in their classrooms. 40% have felt stressed about COVID-19 measures and handling racial issues in their classrooms. Consequences for schools and teachers. One of the biggest consequences that schools can face for violating these policies is the loss of their school funding and their accreditation. This is a horrible thing to happen to schools because every dollar, dollar is essential for a student's success. Additionally, schools can be sued for violating these laws, both the school district and the individual teachers. For teachers, they face a loss of employment or loss of their teaching license. At best, they may be fired from their particular schools, but at worst, they won't be able to teach again. Additionally, there are reporting mechanisms for these policies, which will allow parents or other community members to file a report with the state, and I believe that creates a very antagonistic relationship with teachers and parents. So my research questions. What impact will state bans on teaching materials encompassing race, gender, and sexual orientation in the classroom have on administrators, teachers, student teachers, and other education professionals? So how are teachers changing their instructional strategies to conform or combat these state policies? And do these policies have implications for the ability to retain professionals in the field? Methodology. So I'm in the very early stages of da data collection. I've had the pleasure of talking to two teachers. I'm conducting qualitative interviews to hear their thoughts on the matter. So my preliminary data. The two participants I have talked to both identify as black. I spoke to a black man and a black woman, both who are middle school English teachers. The black woman teaches at a school with majority white and Asian students, with some other students as well. The black man teaches English as a second language, so his population of students is mainly immigrants, and they range from all over the world. So based on my very recent studying of the data, I found a few commonalities. State standards make it challenging to include different perspectives in the curriculum. The black woman wanted to include having the experiences of diverse people in the literature, but it made it challenging too, just because of how they had to follow the Common Core curriculum. The man in the study didn't feel like there was room in his curriculum to include this stuff, but he was not particularly interested. He said that the state standards and having to stick to them made it impossible for them to even violate this law if they wanted to. Both think that it will have an impact on students. 
The woman who taught at a school with primarily white students said that it would harm the students because they were not introduced to diverse, perspe diverse perspectives and they have a very insular community. The man said that he doesn't see it impacting his students because they are so young, but if he was considering older students like high school and college, it could be a really big hindrance to their education. Both have said they would avoid teaching in places where these policies have passed. They said that it wouldn't keep them from educating to an extent, but if they could avoid teaching in places with this extra scrutiny, they would. So I just want to thank you all for coming and listening to me today. I also want to say thank you to Dr. Patrick, my mentor, and to the McNair Scholars Program. Thank you all for listening to me. This has been my last symposium presentation. I've been able to present for three years now, including today. So thank you. Yeah, so I say they're pr primarily being passed in red states, and of course, you know, they're a little bit spread out over the country. Yeah? I think for me, I would say, like, give specific examples, because what I want to do with my work and my research is open the conversation. So though I feel very passionately that these policies are harming students, I don't want to exclude people who think they might be necessary. So I say try to get examples from them and really engage with their perspectives. Yeah? So I will say, just because I'm short on time graduating, this is a part of my honors thesis, I've been using networks from across EMU, so teachers who my professor may know, and essentially other staff who may be connected with teachers. Okay, I'll go at the bottom and then go up. Thank you very much. This is a very informative presentation. And congratulations on your imminent graduation. Thank you. What would you say have you heard about? As top EMU administrator at EMU, whose staff has told numerous people that we need a law like no CRT in Michigan. I'd say they have tried in Michigan and it failed, so I don't think it would go very well. But what I would say to an administrator is, what is your plan for that? Like, I would ask for specific, like, what do you mean going too far? And, yeah, did I answer your question or would you like a more specific? Well, I, I asked that question. I've been to the Okay. And he said, you should be fired. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, that's awful. Um, I haven't been in like an administrative position, so I'm not quite sure how to navigate that situation, but I'd say definitely ask for specifics. And I don't know, sometimes if someone feels really strong about their position, there isn't much you can do, but I'd say you fight for your facts. All right, Dr. E.
I'll read oh, okay. from uh, the. Uh, we'll do that first. I want to make sure I got them in the right order. Uh, professor in Communication, uh, Media, Theater Arts. Yes, and I am faculty advisor for Emma Owens. Uh, she, this project is her final paper in our um, Journalism Media Ethics class um, that was CTATC Journalism 455. This was the final paper in that class. And I'm going to be taking a lot of photos. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Emma Owens, like she said, and I will be giving my presentation on social media use in courtrooms following the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case. Um, I will begin with an introduction about the history and current policy of cameras in courtrooms. Um, starting in 1990, the first formal attempt to introduce cameras occurred. In 1996, the Judicial Conference authorized each federal court of appeal to make their own determination. And in 2010, the Judicial Conference authorized the current camera policy. The current camera policy is that the courts are presumed to be closed to cameras unless a judge grants permission for photography or recording of any kind. Um, pilot programs were ran from 1991 to 94 and from 2011 to 2014. Pilot programs are held in between decisions to test the effect of cameras in courtrooms. The first program was unsuccessful and claimed that the cameras had caused for anxiety and concern. This prompted the push for the next try and the vote for the judges to make the final decision. Um, journalists have the same access to court ho courthouses and court records as other members of the public do. Uh, journalists should also follow a statement of abiding principles when reporting to the media. Journalists are to seek truth and report it by being accurate and fair. They are to minimize harm by treating members of the public as being beings of deserving of respect. They are to be accountable and transparent by taking responsibility and explaining their actions, and they are to be, um, they are to act independently, um, I'm sorry, they are to act independently by being free of obligation to any interest other than the public's right to know. I will be speaking on the Depp and Verse Heard defamation case today. In 2022, previous couple actor Johnny Depp and Amber Heard sued each other with competing defamation claims. Depp sued Heard after she wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post referring to herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. The op-ed did not mention Depp by name, but he claimed it had a negative impact, negative impact on his career, that it defamed him because it was false, and that Heard acted with actual malice by writing it. Heard then filed a countersuit against Depp, alleging that he defamed her when a lawyer representing him released statements saying that her allegations of abuse were a hoax. After hearing six weeks of evidence, a jury unanimously ruled in Depp's favor, leading, later awarding him $15 million in damages. And they also later defamed, they also determined Heard was defamed by Depp's lawyers and awarded her $2 million in damages. Essentially, the jury found that Heard had lied in her opinion piece, but they also concluded that no one should claim that she was lying. Many suggest the jury was confused or was concerned about what would happen to them if they went against public opinion and ruled, uh, ruled against Depp. The large scale of social media is the added element that this trial had in comparison to previously close watched and widely discussed cases. The jury was not sequestered, which is the act of isolating the jury during trial proceedings. Numbers gave a clear indication that the public sided with the jury. A week before the verdict, NPR reported that the hashtag I stand with Amber Heard had gained about 8.2 million views and that the hashtag, I just, and the hashtag justice for Johnny Depp had gained about 20 billion views. In the photo I have included up on my presentation, you can see that Johnny you can sort of see that Johnny Depp had gained about 9.5 million followers during this trial. And on the day of the verdict decision, he gained nearly 2 billion followers on Instagram alone in one day. 
Even though this trial was about defamation, abuse, and key, abuse was a key argument, and it must have been understood that the global broadcast of this trial would have a large impact on victims. Many expressed fear that the jury's verdict would discourage victims of abuse from coming forward. Social media accounts were particularly vicious when attacking Amber Heard and how she behaved on the stand. The extreme use of social media and the rise of the internet can mean that streaming or televising trials could risk putting the jury at much greater risk of being influenced by public opinion. Those against cameras or have noticed downsides to social media in the courtroom have seen the tendency to search for details related to a particular case and share those findings or their opinions with other jurors. Jurors then are able to base their deliberations on false or outdated information that might never have been presented in an open court. On the other hand, supporters claim that cameras increase transparency and that they can alleviate the risk of misinformation in cases by providing an accurate and unbiased account of events that unfold in the courtroom. Something else that gets touched on is that videos of cases could also be a useful research tool by providing insert insight on, into how well jur jurors are doing their jobs and also how well courts are doing theirs. In the Depp versus Heard case, Heard's, Heard's attorneys argued against cameras due to the sensitive nature of the case and Johnny Depp's lawyers argued for it to be televised. Here I have listed some of the most popular televised trials, starting with O.J. Simpson, which became known as the trial of the century. Um, if this list were to be updated, you most likely would be able to see the Depp versus Heard case appear. Um, Depp and Heard's trial became a closely watched and widely discussed trial, but, if it, ha but it did have an added element that O.J. Simpson's did not, which is the scale of social media. And here are my sources. That is it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Hey, we have several minutes for any questions. I know, I think I went a little fast. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Anything? Yes, hello. Uh, question, what is your experience with being in the courtroom? I do not have any personal experience with being in the courtroom. Um, that is why I included my sources at the very end. Um, that is how I gained all of this research. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I do have a question. About uh, in this presentation, I assume you were dealing with federal courts, is that correct? It is correct. Yeah, okay, because I can remember way back when I was an undergraduate, and they had really the first case of any cameras in any court, I believe, in the United States. And I recall public television doing a documentary called Television on Trial about a murder case out in California. But I think that was like a... Uh, state law court or, or municipal court. Okay. And there was yeah. a great deal of resistance then after that uh, on the part of the federal judiciary to bar uh, uh, cameras in federal courtrooms. So this is really what you focused on. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just, so I understand. Anybody else have anything? Yes. So what would you decide to pick this up? Um, I, ooh, um, honestly, it was something that had been going on for so long. Um, journalism is my major. It's something I'm pretty, um, I think, it's something I'm pretty um, passionate about. And also, I think court cases and journalism is something that's widely talked about. I think there hasn't been many trials that have been uh, televised so widely and discussed as this case has been. And also, I think the social media impact that this case had in comparison to other cases is what added to it. Um, I think you can compare, um, this case has been just as largely discussed and watched as other cases have been, um, but the social media impact is what um, kind of drew the line for it. Yeah. I really wanted to clarify something. So when you said the jury was not sequestered, did they still have access to social media? So, yeah, um, they were told repeatedly not to, um, the jury was not sequestered, so they did. They technically didn't have access. I don't believe that they had access. So, I think what happened was that they were told not to. They were told but not to. Still do it and, and the world of, 
in the world of the internet. So maybe they didn't like post things, but I'm sure they were looking at yeah. yeah. they were talking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, during the O.J. Simpson trial, they were yeah. um, sequestered, that and that, um, yeah, juries do like to, or I guess there is information let out that when a jury is sequestered, that can lead to um, more harm than good. Um, so I don't think that's, I think that might be why that they don't do it as much anymore. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, so um, I, I, I guess I'm, in thinking about this, um, you know, there, there are a number of schools now, universities, that um, when a, 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 an undergraduate applies, the university says, don't send us any photographs of yourself, right? Um, because um, one of the reasons is that looking at somebody, you develop perceptions of them, whether it's right or wrong. Beautiful people are favored. You know, people that are overweight, they're, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're prejudiced against them. And I, I'm just wondering about the whole idea of having cameras in courtrooms photographing these people, you know, beautiful people versus, you know, slovenly dressed people and um, rich people who have all the accoutrements versus, versus poor people. And then having that tried in social media. You know, they're obviously in, you know, it, we, we just have these built in prejudices. And I, I'm just wondering what your own views are. Where do you stand on this? Oh, wow. Um, oh, gosh. I think if it's okay, do you mind I get back to you on the answer of that? <laughs> um, I think I might need a minute to. Yeah, well, I think we all do. Because okay. It's yeah, it is. is. I'm like, I think I might need to. Um, I mean, this come back to you on that. Like, it, might, it might have been looks, but I think what it really was was that Johnny Depp just has a bigger star power. Yeah. And he has a huge fan base, and that's exactly. what came out yeah. for him. Yeah. So, I mean, all of his Disney movies and all the stuff that he's done, I mean, he's been in movies since what, the 80s? So, huge fan base. I think there's a lot I could have touched on as well. Um, there's a My paper was 10 pages long, so <laughs> um, I could have touched on a whole lot more. Um, but I focused on certain things throughout this presentation. But I, I would like to get back to you on that question if I'm able to. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I'd love to shoot you an email. Yes. Uh, what are the pros and cons of using social media in, in the uh, courtroom? I do have a slide, actually. I had a for and against slide. Um, if you'd like, to, sorry, I don't want to take up more of your time. Um, I can. Okay, I'm like, I can. You can just pull the slide out. Okay, I'm like. Okay. These are some of them. I have a lot more written down on my paper if you'd like them. Or I can speak to you on my own if you'd like. Of course. Yeah, I mean, if, unless anyone else has any questions for me. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, thank you.
So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alexis Watson. I am a senior here at EMU, majoring in um, African American Studies and Political Science. So, um, today I will be presenting to you all my senior thesis, or the progression of it. Um, it's titled Black Women in Hip Hop, Rap and, Rap and Resistance. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yes. So to begin, um, as I said, this is a progression of my senior thesis, so it is definitely a work in progress. I'm open to all feedback and any questions um, as I'm trying to like spell out things and make things as clear as possible. So first today, um, we're gonna start off with the introduction of my topic, a brief literature review, and then we'll go into what is respectability politics, what is ratchet politics, what is pleasure politics, and my conclusion. So first, this project was born out of my love for black women, more specifically black female hip hop artists, and an understanding of the complexities of our identities and experiences in the United States. With the 50th anniversary of hip hop being last year, it prompted widespread reflection on the genre and inspired me to do the same. Um, my senior thesis aims to look at the ways contemporary black female hip hop artists are navigating the commercial music industry through its patriarchal, misogynoir, and racist expectations and scrutiny, and how they are resisting these notions and finding ways to liberate themselves and their fans. This picture is, to me, speaking to how contemporary artists are building on the traditions of the therefore rap mothers um, and you know, navigating the industry based on those traditions. So first, what does the literature have to say? Um, authors like Rebecca Ferreira and Kelly Hay talk about the community building aspect of the underground hip hop scene in Detroit specifically. They talk about organizations like the Foundation who fostered a sense of belonging for female MCs and a safe place for them to get their raps off and bond with their sister MCs over the music. They also offer a great lens into understanding the commercialized nature of hip hop currently and how this process began, which helps us understand the pressure artists are under to conform and maintain certain expectations in order to gain material success. The point of women using their physical images as a tool to gain material success and financial freedom for not only themselves, but their families and inner communities is one that both Joan Morgan and Cecily Bowen talk about in their work. The notion of black women using what they got to get what they want is a notion that both of these authors point, at, point out as being a part of black women's personal politics to survive a society and industry that is riddled with oppressive, patriarchal, and misogynoir expectations and requirements. This point of the state of many black female hip hop artists when they are entering the rap game and how they're making sense of their often criticized images is one that Kathy and Dolly makes in her work, telling the many stories of black female hip hop artists, popularly known and not. She makes sure to emphasize the confinements within the industry that black female hip hop artists have to navigate while also paying attention to how they are resisting these confinements in the past and the present. I mean, yeah, present, present. She emphasizes why it is important for us to understand the landscape black female hip hop artists are working within in order to understand why their resistance looked the way it does. Further, this point of black women's resistance taking on a multitude of different approaches is amplified in Brittany Cooper's work, where she discusses black women's rage as a necessary survival tool. She mentions how black women are often scrutinized for the ways in which they express themselves, despite constant racist and misogynoir expectations and limitations that their actions are viewed through. She mentions respectability politics and its failure to black women and girls and how hip hop has created space for them to resist notions of respectability and create an identity 
based on an entitlement to self-expression. So, what is respectability politics? In order to understand the conditions that black female hip hop artists and black women are living in and constantly trying to resist, it is important that we build a grounding for what respectability politics is and how, is it, how it is particularly harmful to black women. Brittany Cooper defines respectability politics as being the belief that black people can overcome the many everyday acute acts of racism by dressing properly and having an education and social comportment. Respectability politics at its core is a rage management project. This is in her book, Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Finds Her Superpower. The sentiment is shared by Patricia Hill Collins as well, who defines it as the politics of respectability being aimed for white approval. Achieving respectability pivoted on adhering to standards of white femininity inherited from the tradition of Southern chivalry. Not only were these traditions difficult for black female industrial and domestic workers to achieve, to the dismay of middle class reformers, many working class women rejected them. In her work, Black Sexual Politics, African American Gender, and the New Racism. This idea that respectability sought to prove black folks worthy of the equal rights and human dignity that they were seeking from white society is one that is common amongst black feminist and hip hop feminist critiques of respectability politics. It is important to note, as Patricia Hill Collins said, despite black folks wanting to be accepted, they were instead not offered the same rights or human dignity of their white counterparts. Black women, especially those in working and poor class, often not, were often not able to achieve the expectations or requirements that respectability politics set forth to offer. Despite this being a point of shame and unbelonging for black women, this also prompted black women to engage in resistance strategies to resist respectability politics and all over and white supremacy as a whole. Notions of being ashamed and of oneself and being silenced because of it. So further, what is ratchet politics? The term ratchet is used to describe the perceived uncouth of a woman. Ratchet politics is a tool and ideology used by black women that engage with perceived ratchet behaviors, ideas, and images to liberate themselves from the oppressive limitations and expectations of respectability and white supremacist notions of what femininity is and should look like. It's the embodiment of the loud mouth, slang using, long nail, and weave wearing, fun having, trend setting, black and brown girls and women who have used their ratchetness to create, inspire, and mobilize their political and individual agendas. The term ratchet has been used to condemn black women for being promiscuous, unkept, and lacking dignity. The term is meant to denote notions of shame and make black women feel bad for interacting with said ratchet behavior. I am pulling this definition from many different hip hop and black feminist scholars who position black women embracing notions of ratchetness as a form of resistance against respectability politics. Some of these scholars include Cecily Bowen, Joan Morgan, and Brittany Cooper, to name a few. Cecily Bowen specifically talks about black women's rationness being the site of their magic and creativity, and mentions how black women hip hop artists are the actors of this kind of politics through their praxis. Thus, having an understanding of ratchet politics and black women's embracement of it as it relates to being used as a tool of resist resistance is important in understanding the current landscape of black female hip hop artists and the mechanisms they are using to li liberate themselves. So some examples of ratchet politics. When it comes to being putting both ratchet and pleasure politics in practice, black female hip hop artists do it like no other. Scholars like Morgan, Cooper, and Bowen all identify black women hip hop artists as being the practitioner of these politics. Megan Thee Stallion is only one of the many black female hip hop artists who are embracing ratchet politics and mobilizing it on a global stage. Megan, a Houston native rapper, rose to prominence in 2019 when she broke the industry and internet for her sexually expressive lyrics and tall, thick, natural frame. She was a defiance of everything that was acceptable of black female hip hop artists at the time and entered the industry in a way that excited black girls and women. She coined the term Hot Girl Summer, which turned into a hashtag and took over the internet. Scholar Kaisha Jennings speaks to the impact of Hot Girl Summer on black women within digital spaces, but the term also took over the popular industries like TV, film, and major brands who have collaborated with Megan or used her likeliness to promote notions of Hot Girl Summer. Megan defined the term on Twitter as being unapologetically you and being confident and having fun in your body. This definition was in response to the white supremacist media trying to mangle and define high girl summer for themselves. 
This act is inherently a practice of ratchet politics, as Megan was able to mobilize the term to her fan base who used it as a way to act on their most ratchet desires and not feel any shame or lack of self-worth because of it. So further, what is pleasure politics? Pleasure politics is a term coined by Joan Morgan in her work, Why We Get Off, Moving Towards a Black Feminist Politic of Pleasure. In her dissertation, entitled It's Time We Get Off, Claiming a Politics of Pleasure in Black Feminist Theory, she defines the term as being a liberatory black feminist project. It elevates the need for sexual autonomy and erotic agency without shame to the level of black feminist imperative. This politic was created out of a critique of black feminism and its lack of politics surrounding sexual desire and interaction with erotic and pleasure. Scholars like Joan Morgan, Brittany Cooper, Trevor Les Lindsay, and other scholars who refer to themselves as the pleasure ninjas were founded to help conceptualize this politic. Further, Morgan says that her work around developing the pleasure politics was to challenge the lens of black female sexuality, being a site of racial and sexual trauma, and create a new lens to view black women's relation to their sexuality and sexual desires through. Thus, having an understanding of both ratchet and pleasure politics as ideologies that black women are using as tools in their practice to liberate themselves in their communities or fan bases helps us to understand how black female hip hop artists are using these politics and practices through their brands, social media presence, and song lyrics, and gives us theoretical and historical understandings of why black women choose this kind of liberatory politics. So, some examples of this pleasure politics. Further, many black female hip hop artists today are building off the traditions of their four hip hop mothers to reimagine black women's relationship to sex and erotic pleasure. Many artists exemplify this politic, but one that stands out to me the most is Sexy Red. The St. Louis native gained prominence in 2023 with her viral song, Pound Town, when it came out and rocked the internet. Despite sexy, red, despite sexy Red and her music and image being deemed as controversial, I view her as being another black female hip hop artist who was following in the tradition of her four black female hip hop mothers who used their platforms to mobilize and reimagine black women's relationships to sexuality. In an interview with Complex Magazine, Sexy Red talks about her comfortability with talking about sex in her songs. As she says, she talks about her sexual desires, relationships, and experiences with her friend every day. So this is not out of the norm for her. When asked if she cares about her music being perceived as hypersexual, she says she does not care, as the only opinions that matter to her are the ones from her fans who relate to and love her music. She says she, her music is for the girls, her kind of girls, and if you don't get it, it's simply not for you. This refusal to comply to acceptable notions of sexuality is only the, not only the embodiment of pleasure politics, but also shows the resistance practices of it and in black female hip hop artist tradition. <laughs> to conclude, I conclude that hip hop through the influence of black feminist practices via ratchet and pleasure politics gives way to new possibilities of feminist liberatory practices by directly confronting and critiquing respectability politics and the Eurocentric norms in liberal cultural assimilation. I see these politics as theoretical grounding for the resistance work black female hip hop artists are engaging themselves and their fans with. Thank you.
Right. No, definitely. That's um, an idea that kept coming up in my project that I guess I was finding a little trouble with at the beginning of my project. Um, the literature does definitely discuss it. Um, I would say that the literature that probably discusses it the most is Rebecca um, Ferreira and Kelly Hayes' book, which speaks about like the underground hip hop scene of Detroit, but it like talks about it um, in relation to like the hip hop industry as a whole. So it talks about like you're saying the commercialization of hip hop and like when this shift took place, how certain expectations had to like also take place in order for artists to become successful. Um, this is also like I said something that's highlighted in most uh, of the work that I've read. So it's definitely. Um, an issue, I guess. I, I guess the biggest thing is just trying to not, like, what you're saying is very real about, like, women obviously feeding into this, like, desirability um, of, like, the male gaze. But I also feel like in that same breath, um, like, with those kind of understandings, we have to, like, not condemn them from for succumbing to these kinds of, you know, yeah. expectations. Yeah, I see them in some cases as one, you're victimized by harvest, mm -hmm. and you just want to get out. Yeah. And so for me, I try to be very vocal about that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that they Thank you so much, and I hope I answered your question. Okay. <laughs> All right, now we have the second part of our double feature from Parker Gray, uh, who is in this presentation mentored by Professor Bob. It's my pleasure to introduce Parker Gregg again for his second presentation. He has been in uh, several classes from almost an hour in the United Nations with all of these discussions of political thought. And this semester, he's going to see us in religion and politics. And this presentation is part of his research for task force. And it focuses on the nuances of religion and politics here in the United States with focus on gender and All right, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Sultani. Um, and thank you for being my faculty advisor for this project. I also wanted to thank everybody who came out and supported me today. Um, all right, so this presentation uh, looks at a critical moment in America's religious and political history that saw the formation of the modern religious right in America uh, come in the wake of major social progress towards greater gender and racial equity. Um, more specifically, I'm going to be delving into what the origins of the religious right in the US are and how we have some misconceptions about those origins. Now, this is Jerry Falwell. He was a Baptist minister, co-founder of the Moral Majority, and key figure in the formation of the religious right. Uh, now, when I say religious right, I mean the uh, partnership, if you will, between white evangelical preachers and conservative politicians, uh, and the relationship they have had working together in American politics uh, for almost 50 years now. So, Jerry and many others uh, have long perpetuated this myth that the religious right in America stems from a moral opposition, a moral outrage to the Supreme Court's 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized the access to abortion in America. However, when we look at the religious and political history at the time of this decision, the 
uh, it sort of collapses under its own weight, this claim, uh, and is proven to be ahistorical. So, in reality, the landscape uh, in terms of opinion on abortion was far more diverse uh, at the time than arguably it even is today, uh, especially in terms of religion. Uh, and, oh, okay. So, at the time Roe v. Wade was handed down, abortion was largely viewed as a Catholic issue by other Christian sects. And this stands in like a sharp contrast to the way that we tend to perceive of abortion today as, as being like, well, the pro-life stance anyways, is being very deeply cared about by evangelical Christians specifically. Um, and I have a few examples here of this diversity of opinions. This photo was taken at the 1971 Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, at that convention, they passed a resolution that urged all members to push for uh, their state legislatures to pass laws that would allow abortion under certain circumstances. They passed this resolution again in 1974, and then in 1976 with some more restricted, uh, restrictive added caveats. Now, a year prior to 1971 and 1970, the United Methodist Church General Conference uh, put out a public announcement ur urging all state legislatures to repeal oppressive abortion laws. And three years prior to that, uh, then governor of California and future figurehead of the early pro-life movement, Ronald Reagan, signed into law the Therapeutic Abortions Act, which massively liberalized California abortion law at the time and made them only the third such state in the U.S. with, with laws that last on the books. Now, I don't bring up these examples to make out these institutions and people to be some sort of progressive paragons in favor of reproductive rights for their time. Uh, instead, I bring them up to dismantle these claims made by the religious right about their own origins. But that still leaves us with the question of what are the origins of the religious right? And in order to answer that, we have to go back to 1954, to the Brown v. Board of Education decision which deemed segregation and separate but equal to be unconstitutional. Now, in the wake of the Brown v. Board decision, there was a rapid rise in what were known at the time as segregation academies. These were whites only, discriminatory, private schools. They were often uh, uh, affiliated with and run by evangelical Christian institutions. So, uh, Jerry Fall himself actually ran one of these schools in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and if I'm not mistaken, Liberty University is the product of one of those schools today, just under a different name. Uh, and one place where these schools were particularly prevalent was Holmes County, Mississippi. Now, Holmes County's public school district had been desegregated in 1969. And in the two years that followed, they saw their white student population go from 771 to a whopping zero students. Now, the parents of the black school children still enrolled in the Holmes County Public School recognized that these discriminatory segregation academies were still classified under US law as being charitable organizations and thus given tax exempt status. So, they filed a class action lawsuit against the Secretary of the US Treasury and the Commissioner of the IRS, which eventually led to the 1971 Green v. Connolly decision, which stated that any organization engaged in racial segregation and racial discrimination could by definition not be a charitable organization, which then will, would lead to these organizations losing their tax exempt status and donations made to these organizations would no longer be tax deductible under US law. So this began to put the leaders of these white evangelical institutions, these religious leaders, on notice. And following the uh, IRS rescinding Bob Jones University's tax exempt status in 1976, Bob Jones University is founded by Bob Jones Jr., a blatant white supremacist who claims that segregation was mandated by the Bible, right? It's a fundamentalist Christian university. Uh, so following their tax exempt status being revoked, the religious right, or well, these religious leaders began to, began to truly form a political block in opposition to their schools being desegregated and losing their tax exempt status. Meanwhile, 
uh, a lifelong Catholic conservative activist and co-founder of both the Moral Majority and the Heritage Foundation by the name of Paul Weirich, recognized in their rage an opportunity to expand the Republican base by bringing in these, these very upset evangelical white Christians. And this is a quote from a Paul Weirich interview in 1990. What caused the movement to surface was the federal government's moves against Christian schools. And I think this quote is particularly important because you see in it this immediate linguistic shift that Weirich got uh, both conservative politicians and these religious leaders to use once they started working together. So no longer wasn't it, was it an overt defense of segregation. Instead, it was a defense of independent Christian schools from an overbearing uh, and power-hungry IRS that was set to destroy them. Now, it is also in this quote that we see the true origins of the religious right in America. The religious right was not formed uh, due to moral objection to the Roe v. Wade decision, to an objection to reproductive rights. Uh, it was instead formed in defense of segregation and to maintain the tax-exempt status of segregated private schools. So, the men who formed, well, and then also, Jerry Falwell himself uh, didn't even mention abortion until 1978, which is particularly important because the founders of the religious right in America recognized that maintaining being uh, pro-segregation as the core of their political platform was not a long-term recipe for success. And Paul Weirich himself admits that he began to try out different issues with uh, white evangelical voters to see what would stick. And uh, these were including, these included but were not limited to uh, anti-feminism, anti-gay rights, uh, prayer in schools, and banning pornography, uh, among many others. But in the 1978 election, uh, midterm election, uh, there was a handful of Catholic candidates running on pro-life platforms who scored upset victories in Iowa, Minnesota, and New Hampshire. And this began to open the religious rights eyes to what the most effective issue in mobilizing uh, evangelical voters was going to be. And that was abortion and uh, anti-abortion political stances. So the Moral Majority was founded in 1979, and that really cements the creation of the religious right as we know it today. Uh, but even by the 1980 election, when uh, Ronald Reagan, former governor of California, was running for president, he spent far more time on the campaign trail railing against the IRS for its attacks on Christian schools than he did talking about abortion. And abortion didn't even become a rallying cry of his campaign until very late in the 1980 uh, election cycle. Yet, by 1984, it was cemented as one of the most contentious issues in American politics and remains so to this very day. So I think that this moment, these years of American politics and religious history are particularly important because the religious right wing in America remains to be one of the most powerful factions in American politics and one of the key forces against gaining greater gender and racial equity in the U.S. Uh, and assessing their origins shows that not only um, have they always been, oh, well not always, not only are they steeped in a history of being against reproductive rights, but their foundations come from an inherent racism that has never been addressed and continues to fester. And I think that the, both of the presentations that went before the, both of your presentations showcase that. White supremacy from Congress, like congressmen getting on Twitter and belittling like black female rappers, that is the, the racism of the religious right uh, showing its ugly head. Uh, 
religious figures demanding the CRT be banned in, in public elementary schools so children aren't brainwashed to believe in the equality of all peoples. That is the religious right rearing its ugly head. Uh, and yeah, that's why I think that, that this moment is so important. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Christianity at the time, and they they pulled their ideas into like the mainstream, and I think that we see that today. So I think that if you look at the, the farthest fringes of right wing Christian thought, uh, now that they have uh, achieved Roe v. Wade being dismantled, then we can expect what those people are saying to be the issues that they take up next. And a lot of that is Christian national. It's kind of undeniable that Christian nationalism, white supremacist Christian nationalism, is on a huge rise in the United States. And people are getting more and more comfortable just overtly saying that they are Christian nationalists. Um, so I think that's, that's where this starts to come. checking each other and making sure that our loved ones and people that we grew up with are not falling down these like very intense and aggressive rabbit holes that exist all over the internet. Um, but in a more general sense, I don't think that the Democratic Party are going to be our saviors by any means in terms of like national elections. Uh, I think that a greater focus on local community organizing uh, should should be number one um, in combating that like on a hyper local level um, but obviously not all places are safe to do that right uh, one of the things that was included in this present or it was included in my in my research but none of my presentation was that like when Ronald Reagan got elected to was, was running for office one of the first places he went to campaign was Philadelphia Mississippi where three black civil rights well two black civil rights workers went up where three civil rights workers had been murdered about 16 years before, um, and he just encouraged states' rights, right? Uh, if you're in a community like that, it's incredibly difficult to do community organizing. Um, but I think uh, if, if it's gonna be combated, then it has to be on multiple fronts. Local and state level politics, um, community organizing that is outside of electoral politics, and checking in with one another. Is that is that a good enough answer? That's a great answer. <laughs> and, and 
that's all the time we have um, before I start asking questions to get us into another presentation about criminalization and the solving strategies and factoring into this very concept that we're talking about. I'll save that for another time. Please join me in thanking Parker Friends <laughs> and all of our students present presenters today, Parker, Tiara.